Welcome everybody to our first Pin It Canada live virtual event. I'm Audrey DeYoung and I'm so excited to have you here with us today. We are coming straight to your home and spread some creativity with you. We have a jam packed schedule of amazing artists, of demonstrations, techniques, products, unique tours, DIY, and so much more. These presenters are sharing their passion and skill just for you. Make sure that you comment, share, ask questions, and we will try and answer your questions during the show, or we will get back to you after the show. Each segment will award a door prize for those who comment during their segment. So make sure that you comment on the, seg on the segment, ask questions. So make sure you are interactive and afterwards you certainly can have a share party or a watch party with your friends. We'll be notifying the winner during each segment. And if you're unable to join us for the entire afternoon, you certainly can see us on our YouTube channel. And also make sure when you go there to subscribe uh, to the channel and also ring the bell. The, our YouTube channel is Pin It Canada. So when you go into YouTube, just put that at the top and you will see us. Uh, so sit back and enjoy an incredible afternoon of creativity. To kickstart our show today, our first presenter is a superwoman and a friend of mine, Wendy Russell. Wendy is best known as a TV host, creator, and producer of HGTV's She's Crafty. Wendy Russell teaches students and adults across North America to use their creativity to improve their mental health, reduce stress and anxiety, boost confidence, and change their lives for the better. Currently, you can catch her on CTV's City Line in the more, their morning show as one of their regular guests. Today, Wendy will be sharing with us the power of creativity and why the world needs it more now than ever. Hi, Wendy, and welcome. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Pin It Canada virtual conference. I want to share with you a story that few know about me. It's taken me a long time to share something so personal, so bear with me. Um, when I was a kid, looking back now, I go, I had a pretty good life there for a while. That was pretty cool. Um, you know, we lived in a big house. This is not to brag, by the way. This is to add some context to what, what I'm about to share. So I, you know, I had horseback riding lessons and we were very fortunate. I had dance classes and singing classes and learned all my craftiness from my mom and my grandmother. And we took ceramics classes, arts classes learned how to embroider and crochet and all of the things. And when we had friends over, we were getting crafty all the time. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty sweet life. And then one day my life changed forever. <laughs> Record screech halt. You know, life changed at the age of 10. My mom left my dad and a year later we moved from Toronto to Vancouver and I was scared and you know horrified and you know I was leaving all my friends and my family, family and, and starting from scratch and everything up to then was like great so this was gonna be you know this was new but you know it was the first day of grade seven and I was excited to meet my teachers and the prospect of making new friends was kind of cool and I was like oh yeah I have friends with everybody so you know this how hard can this be but I realized by the end of the first day of grade seven, it was gonna be a whole lot harder to make new friends because I was the new girl. And nobody wants to be the new girl's friend. So, uh, you know, everyone's got all their friends by grade seven. And it wasn't just that I was, uh, you know, didn't, couldn't make friends. I was, I was tormented for years in school, emotionally and physically. I was, um, I was spit at and pushed and beat up in the girls bathroom and challenged to fights after school and, you know, called the worst names you can ever imagine. And even though my mom said, you know, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. Uh, that was a total load of baloney. I must've said that to myself a million times coming home from school every day and it didn't make a difference. It really was the names that hurt the most. And all of that stuff started to get to me. It, I let it get to me. And I realized my subconscious, well, I didn't realize my subconscious had decided that if nobody liked me just as I am, that I was going to have to change who I was, become someone different. 
So food was my drug of choice to deal with all of the bullying and the lack of love from my dad and uh, and boy yes did I eat I ate I needed the comfort of food uh, because I felt so unloved by everyone and yet my mom was so nice she would make me this meticulously handcrafted lunch every day she sent it to school with me and I would find a secret spot where no one could see me eat and I would eat my lunch alone and then I would go to the calf the calf where all the cool kids hung out and I would get a second lunch there and then I think I'm pretty sure I ate all of the skinny girls food leftovers as well so very quickly I gained weight go figure um, but you know getting shoved and kicked and punched never hurt as much as you know the names and uh, you're a loser was a common refrain and the more and more I heard it the more I believed it. So in that moment, I made the choice to stay small and to not shine and not stand out and not disturb the status quo and not get started. So I quit everything. I quit crafting and dancing and singing and all of the pursuits and I quit on myself. And I pushed away my biggest dreams in life because I actually I thought my life depended on it. I, I believed that I was physically going to be harmed if someone found out that I had big dreams to be an actor or a dancer or a singer or a creative in any way, shape or form one day. So uh, that, was, that was unsafe for me. So, and yet there was something that was bugging me and I don't know if it was gut, my gut that was telling me not to give up on my dreams. And it wasn't until grade 12 that I had the courage to pursue being an actor and I got an agent, which was great. However, my compulsive overeating went on throughout my 20s. And when I got home from an audition, I uh, would make a giant batch of chocolate chip cookie dough. And rather than putting the cookies in the just eat the cookie dough and if I went to an audition that I thought I nailed I was like yeah I did a good job I would drive myself to uh, you know a fancy coffee shop and buy myself a fancy coffee and a giant cookie <sighs> yeah that didn't work either and then one day I found a book that changed my life forever called when food is love by Janine Roth and I realized that I used food to comfort me for all the times that I didn't feel good enough or talented enough or nice enough or kind enough or whatever it was, I was not enough. And, uh, you know, cause I used to be very crafty. I would, you know, make stuff for my house and gifts for my friends. But all of a sudden I realized I was too busy trying to be famous and I stopped being crafty and I ate instead. So the next time that I got home from an audition that I thought I blew, rather than eating the cookie dough, I started making things again. And I realized that crafting and, you know, creating and painting and sewing and making gifts and building things saved my life. It changed my life for the better. And I knew if creativity changed my life for the better, it could definitely help others too. And that's how my TV show, She's Crafty, was born. So, but here's the thing. This is going to sound pretty wild, but as a society, we've been lied to. We've been lied to since kindergarten. We've been programmed to behave a certain way. We've been programmed to speak when spoken to. We've been told that academics is of paramount importance and all of that other stuff like creativity and creative pursuits, just leave that. That's not going to get you anywhere. And then we need to go and we need to find a nice person and get married and buy a house and have kids and work for 40 hours a week for 40 years of our life and, uh, you know, retire at 65 and live off 40% less of our income in, um, 40% less of our income in retirement. And it's an actual thing. It's, it's called the 40, 40, 40 it was a thing that was developed 70 years ago when we were living, we were only living to 65, but 95% of us are still doing that system. Don't buy into the lie that adulting is about any, something other than being creative. Don't buy into the lie that adulting is anything other than being creative. I believe the world will be a kinder, more peaceful place if we all valued creativity as much as we seemingly value power and money and possessions and fame. 
if we allowed ourselves to be creative on a daily, there would be no war and no hate and no hurt and no racism. Being creative is an act of kindness for ourselves. And when we're kind to ourselves, we're automatically kinder to others. You may have heard of social media guru and author Gary Vaynerchuk, who said, you know what? I believe people don't like their lives or their jobs and they're, they're consuming things to escape and I'm trying to get them to create, to get happy. So I second that, Gary. I second that. Jack Marr from Alibaba.com, he said, you have one advantage as a human over AI and that is your creativity, your ability to innovate. The World Economic Forum says that creativity is going to go from the 10th most important job skill in the world to the third most important job skill in the next year. It's more important than negotiation skills. And global CEOs say it's, it's the most important leadership quality for success in business today. Inc. Magazine has now said that 70% of people aren't satisfied with their career choice so there's 70% of people that are not go going to work that are happy. That isn't, doesn't even count for the people that hate their job. This is 70% that went, oh, I wish I was doing something probably a little more creative. So if you don't love everything that's going on in your life right now, you try easing an element of creativity into that a hobby, a sport, a project, a talent, what I like to call your creative genius is so underestimated. We get caught up in our daily lives. We forget that there is an eight year old inside there somewhere dying to get out. Here's my challenge to you. If you have no idea what your creative genius is, now is the perfect time to try some new things. Journaling turns people into writers. Uh, going onto canva.com turns people into entrepreneurs and, and graphic artists. By the way, I have no connection to canva.com, but I love using it. You can turn on your GarageBand app. You turn That turns people into musicians. Coloring in a coloring book turns people into artists. You can take a cooking class, a coding class, a baking class. Master an Excel spreadsheet. Try your hand at building something. Take an old piece and repurpose it or upcycle it. You can master, uh, you know, patching a hole in your wall. Maybe someone's punched a hole in your wall that you haven't fixed. It's sitting there for so long. The key is... Be totally detached to the income. That's what's fun and freeing about this. There's no pressure to be brilliant on the first time that you try something or the 12th time that you try something. Believe me, coming from someone speaking from experience, don't put that pressure on yourself. It, this is just fun and freeing. Creativity is the secret to dealing with any adversity in your life. It is the, the key to dealing with loneliness, it is the key to dealing with not feeling good enough. It is the key to dealing with being bullied. It is the key to dealing with a down day. And you know why? Because creativity is the key to happiness. Creativity makes you feel good. It, it, it makes you smarter. It gives you a sense of accomplishment. It, it, it stops you from, uh, stops all that noise from going on in your head. Creativity is a necessity for us humans, and it is the key to happiness. Like maybe you, many kids, maybe even your kids, I, I was bullied in school and I quit doing everything that I loved so that other people would like me, so that other people wouldn't feel threatened or intimidated by me. And you know what? It made me feel terrible and exhausted, and I wasn't being authentic. I knew I wasn't being my true self and I don't want any person to go through that, especially young women, um, you know, like I did. It, it took me years of personal development and work to, to heal and actually accept myself and live authentically. And now I'm, I gotta share this with you. I'm working on something really exciting. Starting August 4th, I will be launching a 12 week leadership mastermind for young women ages 13 to 17, they're, they're going to build their confidence through creativity. They're going to learn to develop their social and emotional learning skills, up level their leadership and their, uh, their, and their character. They're going to use their creativity to improve their mental health, health, reduce their stress and anxiety, uh, especially during this whole new world of, uh, you know, social media that they're, they're dealing with. It's an incredible, 
incredible opportunity for them to express their creativity and stop playing small and own their potential. And I believe that kindness starts with being kind to ourselves and that will radiate to everyone in the world. And I believe that worlds can be a better, kinder, more peaceful place if we all allowed ourselves to be creative. So if maybe you know somebody who might benefit from this opportunity to work with me, you can email me at heycreativegenius at gmail.com or just throw me an email to say hi at heycreativegenius at gmail.com. And as RuPaul said, don't take life too seriously. Take love seriously. Take kindness seriously. And above all the rest, just have fun. If you follow your heart and you dare to be different and you use all the crayons, all the colors in the crayon box, you never know where you'll end up. And perhaps it will be here on the Pin It Live virtual conference, learning how to share your creative genius with the world. Thank you. Uh, our next guest is here, Ben. Somebody Hi, that's been involved in our show. So Ben, why don't you explain your new business for us? Well, Kari Spy is an art supply distributor. So we do sell to stores and small shops and artists. Uh, art supplies and we now have a manufacturer where we make our own canvases and our own, our own uh, frames too. So as you can see we have a lot of different kind of molds, moldings in the back and we do make our own canvas too with a private label and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, so that's what we do for, uh, for now. We're expecting having more and more coming in but for now I think it's still a big, uh, big pie to fill up. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> What what are you going I, to show us? Well, we, I filmed like this morning. We just got back the electricity in the new manufacturer uh, yesterday night at night, eight o'clock. So we just were able to make a little video of how we mount uh, a canvas uh, this morning. Uh... Well, maybe could you take us for a tour of uh, the location there and just share some of the things that you're doing there? Sure. Make that a might tour. work for now and then maybe later on and we can get the video up. Sure. So here's the store where all the art supplies are with the brushes we do have, all the mediums and stuff. We do have our canvases already made here, which we have much more than manufacture. And then everybody sings everything, yeah? The paper side. Here is the smaller one, which is in Chateau Gay. The one in St. Catherine is, is a, a bit bigger. But here we have like about 3,500 square feet plus the little uh, classroom in the back. Wow. Yeah. So these are all the frames that we do. This, these are all like in stock. Uh, regular sizes are all in there. I'm not going to go in the back. Classroom is full of stock like that we just brought in for a couple, couple uh, weeks uh, during our uh, renovations and moving. But uh, yeah, so this is about it. These are about all the moldings we do have, but there's always more and more and more. There's another wall in the other side that I won't show you because it's pretty a disaster in the back. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the, the, the video is just like, uh, see, this is the rainbow for uh, ça va bien aller en français, which means everything will go right. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so yeah, so the video would be like a demonstration of how Robert, the, the guy that's working, the manufacturer's making uh, the canvas, the stretch canvas. So he cut, he mount everything. He did it by hand um, for on that video because the machines were not all uh, <laughs> powered. But uh, now everything is, is ready, but he did it by hand this morning. So at least people would be able to see how it works. And by the way, um, I don't know exactly how it work, Audrey, but uh, the, the gift that um, Cadex Pie is going to give, we're going to give a Jikli as a prize for the people. So people could have like their own picture uh, or uh, painting um, that we're going to print and we're going to mount for them and we're going to send it to their address. Oh, wow. So that's going to be a incredible. gift from to the people that are looking at Pin It Canada video. Yes. Perfect. Good. Okay, so here we go. This morning for Pinnit Canada, we're going to have a video of how we mount frames in Calipire. So here we go. We start this now. First cut. Here 
here we have to measure everything one by one. So it's going to be perfectly square. Sides are cut down. Now we have to put them all together. Starting with the compressor. We're, usually, we're, uh, electricity. electricity doesn't work today, so we had to get um, generators to make everything work. So the compressor is cutting more than uh, ever. But anyway, at least it must be how it works. So usually we don't, with them, we don't make them like one by one because it's, uh, you have to adjust everything all the time. So uh, usually we do like about 24 each size at a time. Saves up, saves up time and uh, a lot of um, less adjustments. It's been only uh, 35 years that Rob is doing canvas and frames, so seems easy. But I'm telling you, I tried a couple of times. Thank you very much for joining us. Ben had to <laughs> lock his door so the customers wouldn't come in during this. So now you can go back and uh, unlock the doors and open the business again. So <laughs> I'll do now. There's only two people. It's, it's less than usual, so it's all good. Yeah, Perfect. but you're worth well, it, Audrey. You're more than worth it for that. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ben. <laughs> well, check out Ben's uh, website, new website. We have it on the screen. And uh, we look forward to having you with us again at one of the shows coming up. And, and take care. Good luck with the business. Can't wait. Take care. Bye. Au revoir, tout le monde. Well, that was interesting. And again, thank you everybody for being so patient with our technical difficulty. So uh, next up, we have Tracy Morrow. Tracy is from Fredericton, New Brunswick. She is classically trained artist with 40 years of experience. Her combination of fine art, faux finishing, and the decorative arts makes her work unique. Tracy's divine design work is varied from home decor to mixed media. She is versatile and creative and generous with her knowledge and experience. And she has such a sense of humor and a relaxed atmosphere in her teaching uh, that she loves. Uh, all her students are always uh, commenting how amazing she is and uh, that they just always feel so relaxed in her, in her class. Uh, Tracy is a dynasty artisan and also a decorative art brand ambassador. Uh, Tracy will be demoing. She sent in a demo for us today on image transfer on stone tile for a slick and pretty coaster set. So enjoy. Hey everyone, I'm Tracy Morrow and today I'm going to show you how to make these really cool, really chic, really fun decor coasters. They're made from stone tiles. I've got them at a local uh, home improvement center and we're going to use a technique called image transfer and this fabulous new product from um, Decorart. This is a Decorart Americana decor image transfer medium. This stuff is fantastic. It is formulated to work on everything from furniture to general craft, so you're really going to love it for this project. It's easy to use, it's water-based, it doesn't have a horrendous odor. It's a really great product to work with. So we're going to work with the Americana Decor. We're going to need a good quality um, one inch, three quarter inch flat brush to apply it with, and we're going to need some stone tiles just like these. These are nice and smooth. Uh, these are available, as I said, from Home Improvement Center. Most of the Home Improvement Centers now uh, require you to special order if you're going to be ordering a quantity of these. They don't ordinarily have them in stock in the store. However, having said that, um, you can find these in store quite frequently. And these are those uh, batches of tiles where they have 
you know, a larger one and then smaller ones. And these are all attached on the back side with a, a fusible web of sorts. Interesting thing is you can cut these apart. So in one of these sheets is four, four inch tiles, plus a bunch of the smaller ones, which you can use for other things. So you just simply cut this apart and then peel that webbing off and it actually comes off quite easily. So then you'll have four individuals tiles and most of the time these larger uh, web type uh, tiles are available quite reasonably priced and I think in this case they were about $11 for this, this big block of tiles at our local Home Depot. So what you need is that great quality stone tile. You're also going to need uh, some photocopies or some laser print images. There is a pattern associated with this video, so you'll be able to download the PDF and it will have all of these images in it. So the cool part, you're going to have these images cut out. Don't be too meticulous, but get close to the images you possibly can. The goal is to create these. This is a set of coasters with an image transfer on the front. On the back, we've simply adhered these little um, silicone things. We made four of them so that they all stack up very nicely. And they wear well. The first set that I ever made is still in use almost 10 years later. So these are a really great little project. They make wonderful gifts. And they're very easy to make and, and affordable to make. If you're buying a, a case of these tiles, you can usually get 36 or so for about $25, 25 to $30. So you can make a lot of coaster sets uh, just from one box of tiles. So let's get started and let me show you how to do this. Easy peasy. Make sure that your tile is clean. That is important, that it's clean. There's no dust or anything on it. So I just take a, a piece of damp shop towel and wipe it down so that I get all the dust off. Then you're going to open your medium. Now this stuff kind of looks like cold cream, like a thin cold cream. It dries perfectly clear. Although it's white in the jar, it's going to dry perfectly clear. So now that I've wiped down my tile, I'm going to dry it so that I have a nice dry surface. And we're going to apply a nice generous coat of the image transfer medium over the surface. Now I say generous, that doesn't mean gobs of it. You want it covered, just like that. Easy peasy. So once that's done, you're going to take your image and you're going to lay it face down into that wet medium. And then with the tip of your finger, press it into place. Now remember, it's wet, going dry paper going into a wet medium, so you'll probably see a little buckling. But we have a solution to that. So now you're going to take, uh, this is just a piece of shop towel, and it's been moistened in water. And I'm going to wipe away the excess, but I'm working from the center of the paper, and I'm changing the cloth around, to remove all of that excess medium from the, the tile. I do this because I don't want a big line around my image. It's going to give you a nice clean thing. The other thing is that by wiping it away, you prevent any of that excess medium from getting on the back of the paper. If you get this medium on the back of the paper, you're never going to be able to get it off. So I wipe away any excess. In that process, it moistens the paper. And then what that does is, when the paper is moist, it lays nice and flat. It stretches out, and so you don't get the ripples and the bubbles and whatnot in the surface. And so when it dries, it dries nice and tight to the surface, like this. So no ripples, no folds, no nothing in it. So once you've gotten to this stage, you make sure that it is firmly pressed into place. If you have a brayer, go ahead and use it. You can use a paint bottle you know, just by rolling it like this to ensure that it's well seated. That will work too. So once you have it in this way, you're going to set it aside and you're going to allow it to dry thoroughly. Now the jar says anywhere from three to six hours. I've found that if I put it in a good spot with great ventilation, it's dry in about an hour. Uh, you can pick it up and, and work with it. However, the longer it sets, the better. 
So if you're doing a bunch of these, set them aside, let them dry overnight, and then you can come back and do the next step the following day. Okay, so I set that one aside to dry. Put my brush into some water to get that medium out. And I'm gonna close up my jar nice and tight so that it stays perfect for the next time. Decorwork Image Transfer Medium. Awesome stuff. So our next step. Here I have a tile that is well, well dry. This one has been sitting down here overnight. And I'm going to take that, remember our wet shop towel? I'm going to take my wet shop towel, and it is quite wet, it's not dripping, but it's quite wet. And I'm going to moisten the back of this paper. And the first thing that happens as soon as that moisture hits, you can see that image right through. So if you get that paper nice and moist, and as you scrub, you'll notice that it starts, that paper starts to ball up and roll off. You see these little bits. Let's zoom in a little bit here so you can get a better look. Here we go. So you can see all these little bits of paper are starting to roll off. So if you take your fingers, more and more of that paper will roll off. And you just keep working gently. You are washing the baby's face, not scrubbing the kitchen floor. So, nice, gentle, circular fashion. And you will notice that those, look at those little white paper bits are just rolling off very easily. Now remember, you have just remoistened everything that you had let dry overnight. So if you're a little too aggressive with this, you could potentially literally re-moisten the adhesive of that medium and then pull the, the image right off the surface. So take your time and work carefully. So just like that, you can see that that image is starting to clarify very nicely. And look how clean that image is. So you just continue in that fashion. If you find that the image starts to pull off, let me show you an example. If you get a little too aggressive as you're working and you re-moisten it, you'll see spots like this where the adhesion or that medium underneath has literally come away from the surface. And it's usually because the medium is either not dry enough or you've re-moistened it to the point where it just releases. So at some point as you're working, stop and let things dry a little bit like I've done here. So you can re-moisten this and then start working again. And this is where that fingertip comes in very handy because you can tell where the paper is. Even though you may not be able to see it, you can feel it. It sort of feels a little rough. And you'll know when you've got all the paper off too because you'll be able, you won't be able to tell where the stone and the paper begin, which is kind of cool. So you just work until you have the bulk of the paper removed from your surface. And once it looks like almost everything is gone, and you're not quite sure, it feels like it's smooth, but you're not absolutely sure, just set it aside and let it dry for a few minutes. And what you will see is something like this. It's sort of hazy. It kind of looks a little frosted, you know, in spots. And when it's dry, it's hard to tell that it's paper, but you'll be able to see it. It's sort of a hazy, foggy, fuzzy look. So you just simply re-moisten it like that with that shop towel or you know baby's face cloth, something like that. Re-moisten it and then use your fingertips again to remove the excess paper. Now, one of the things that frustrates people with doing image transfer is that you see the line sometimes as you're working that where that paper ended. And there's a really cool way to eliminate that. And I'm gonna show you in just a second. Part of the reason that it shows up the way it does is quite simply, this one's actually quite good. Uh, there is a faint line there, but it's not too bad. Let me put it up here, maybe you can see it. It's very faint, 
but you can see that there where that paper ended right there. So we're going to give this a seal. And because we used image transfer to put the image down in the first place, we can seal with it. So I'm going to take a good quality, nice soft brush and a little of that image transfer medium. And I'm going to seal the image in. This does two things. One, it protects the image. This stuff dries very, very hard. So essentially it's like a good quality matte varnish. It's going to give you a nice uniform finish and it'll give you that great protection that you need. So that is all there is to that. So once these are completely dry, you've got a coat of that matte medium on there to protect the image. Then you just flip them over and then use these little adhesive silicone pads or the little felt pads on the back. And they're wonderful. They're great for hot or cold. You can put glasses on them and they're very easy to keep clean. So if any spills and whatnot, just a damp cloth will take care of anything that happens to get onto them. So that is it. How easy is that to create a really fun, classy gift with image transfer and Decor Americana Decor Image Transfer Medium. I'm Tracy Morrow. Thanks for joining me. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. You can reach me out via my website at tracymoreaudesign.net. If you are looking for Decor Americana Image Transfer Medium or any of the Dynasty brushes, check out MoraineBaker.com. She is a Decorate and Dynasty brush distributor. Thank you for joining me. Have a great day. Thank you, Tracy. That was fabulous. What a neat technique for sure. A uh, neat project and just great to have you with us live here as well, because I know that I see you in the comments that people are asking questions. So if you have any other questions for Tracy, uh, please just put them in the comments and she will get back to you. And also, like she mentioned, you can go to uh, tracymorrow.net uh, to get more information from her. So um, our next guest, as we keep moving along here, um, sometimes your paths cross with somebody that you say, wow, I feel like I've known this person forever. And this person is Becky Sharfstein McGettigan. Is that right? That's it, Sharfstein oh, McGettigan. I've said it over and over again. I thought, you know, I never said it to Becky to say, is that the proper way to say your name? So I'm so glad I got it correct. Welcome, welcome, Becky. Thank you. So just a little bit about yourself. You are um, own your own business, Creative Haven. YXE in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. It's a yes. DIY studio, classroom, and retail store. Becky started teaching crocheting over six years ago and fell in love with teaching. Uh, she now teaches classes in all things crafty, and your latest passion is advocating for the mental health benefits of creativity in both children and adults. Hi, Becky, and welcome. So nice to have you with us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, great, great. So what are you going to do for us today? So today we're going to do a walkthrough of a traveler's notebook or traveler's journal. And then I'm going to show you how to put the pages together and bind it all together and do the closure. Awesome. Well, you know what? We're just going to get right to it. And then uh, I'll come back on when you're done. So enjoy, Perfect. everybody. Becky Perfect. from Creative Haven. Hi everyone, this is Becky here at Creative Haven YXE and today I'm just going to do a walkthrough on a couple of the traveler's notebooks that I have done. So what I do is I will make a traveler's notebook when I'm um, getting ready to go for a trip. I find it a lot easier to have my notebook with me instead of coming home trying to print off all my pictures and then get them into a notebook. So this is what I do. So this is one that I took with me to Calgary. So I'm just gonna move my camera down here so you guys can see what I'm doing. All right, there we go. So this is the notebook that I took on one of my trips to Calgary. And I will have it all bound and put all of the pictures in as I go. So I just bring my little mini printer and print off the pictures as I'm 
traveling. My friends often joke because I'll be sitting at lunch putting pictures into my traveler's notebook. Uh, and then when I come home, all of my photos and all of my memories and all of the things I really wanted to remember about the trip are in and ready to go. So let's jump right in and I'm going to show you how to make your own traveler's notebook. So this is the one that we're going to do today. Now I have kits available for this on our website, which is creativehavenyxe.ca. So you can purchase the kit. In the kit for these, you will get everything you need to put it together. So you get all of the papers, the elastic, the eyelets to make the closure, the um, here I have used, and I'm going to show you how to do that with Baker's twine. We're going to put that together and all of the pages. It has all the measurements. There's also a video tutorial on our website if you uh, want to take a look. So let's dive right in. This is the journal that we're going to be constructing today. And so I will take it on my next trip next time we get to leave the city. And as I'm gone, I will put my notes in it, put my pictures in it, fill it up, then I come home and it's finished. So the first thing that you need to do is I will put my cover together. So for the cover, the kit comes with a piece of vinyl. You can use vinyl, cardstock, leather, uh, other materials. There's lots of different things that you can do. We've used vinyl for this one. And then I've gone ahead already and cut out. So the vinyl is cut to seven and three quarters, seven, sorry, seven and a quarter by nine and a quarter by seven and a quarter. Then you just fold that in half. The, then I have a piece of cardstock underneath that I've already gone ahead and cut and adhered and rounded the corners for that uh, and adhered that. That one is cut down to seven and one eighth by nine and one eighth. Then I've cut two pieces of decorative paper that I just wanted to use, cut them down the middle so that I'm not sewing through more than necessary, more pages than necessary, and I've also adhered those. Now, my corner chomper won't chomp the corners on, a, uh, on the vinyl. So what I do is I'll just chomp the corners on my piece of cardstock and then take my scissors and trim that up and just follow along so that I've got the same curve on the vinyl and the paper. So now that's ready to go. So at this stage is when I usually like to put my closure in. Um, so you're going to measure and find the center of this piece here for the back. So the closure, as we saw on this one, is this wraparound closure. So what we're going to be doing is you're just going to find the center on your back, poke through to put your eyelet in there, and then attach your eyelet, wrap your elastic, and there you have it. So the crocodile that I use is the big old one. I love this one. I use it a lot more than I use my small handheld one. Uh, so I get a lot of use out of it. Definitely worth it. So after we've put our closure in and we've wrapped the closure around the front, this one here is just secured with two eyelets. Then we weave uh, the elastic through the back of it. And that's the closure on that one. So once the closure is done, I'll just set this all aside and I'll start working on my signatures. So this is, some of my junk journals have many signatures. Some of them have just um, one or two. This one is only going to have one because it's for a specific trip and I don't want that many pages. So I don't want to end up with blank pages at the end of my trip. So usually what I'm doing just for a single trip, I will do between six and 10 pages, depending on how many I have, uh, how many days I'm going to be gone for. So this is the signature I've chosen for this one. I've gone ahead and cut the paper. So all of the paper is cut to nine by seven and then just scored at the four and a half and they're all folded in half. I've also rounded the corners and I've distressed the edges with um, distress ink, the photo, vintage photo is what I've used to distress all of the edges on this one. 
So once we've got our signatures, I'll go through it a couple times to make sure that I have all of my pages facing the right way. More than once I have done this and then realized that I don't have my pages all facing the same way and it's too late because it's already sewn into my book. So after I get that all together, made sure that my pages are going the same direction. I'm going to clip them all together. So I'm just gonna clip them here, pushing in the center part. So I'll push really well right here to make sure that it's all clipped together nicely and it's tight. Then I'll put a little clip up there. Now I'm going to mark with my pencil and poke all the holes with my awl. So for this one, I'm just gonna turn this here. So for this one, I want one right in the center and then each of the holes an inch apart from there. So I know this is seven, so at three and a half is the middle. I'm gonna put just a little dot right at the three and a half, right on the score line in the middle. And then an inch from there, and an inch from there, and one more for good measure. So I'm just marking on the center page, on the very middle, an inch apart for each one. Then I'm going to use take my awl and poke all my holes. I like to put a piece of foam underneath me. I find that that works the best. I've also used a phone book before. Just something that you are not going to. I find a cutting board ends up ruining my awl. It starts to dull it. Now I'm going to poke all of the holes. And you just want to make sure you go through all of them and that they're tightly secured. There we have it. You can go through the signature and the cover all at once. I don't like to do that. I like to line them up after just to make sure that they're lining up really well and exactly where I want them. So I'll do that now. So now I'm gonna grab my cover and I'm going to take the first page here where I poked all the way through. I'm going to line this up exactly as it's going to fit in the book and I can see my holes that I've just poked. I'm going to mark those in the very center of the cover, exactly where the holes are. Again, making sure to work along the score line right in the center and then I'm gonna poke these out now as well with my all, same procedure. So if you're doing more than one signature in your book, you would just line up the next, after you poke these holes, then I line up my next signature where it's gonna go and I will have all the holes poked for all of the signatures prior to sewing any of them in. I find that it goes a lot smoother if that's what you do. So then I'm going to get my signature back, double check, make sure that all of my pages are going the right way. Yes, they are. Then I'm going to line that up in the book. Exactly where I want it, making sure it's in the center. And I'll usually just clip this on the edge. All right, now we're going to sew in our signature. I have used all kinds of things to sew in my signatures. I have used just cotton thread. I have used baker's twine, which is what we're going to use today. I have used... Um, embroidery floss is also one of my favorites. There are, I've used my sewing machine. Tip for if you're going to use your sewing machine to sew anything in, just make sure that you go slowly and stay on the line, on your score line. And I use a denim needle. I find that a denim needle will go through the six to 10 pages with ease. If you have more or if your cardstock is heavy, a sewing machine, your basic sewing machine might not be the best choice for you. So from here, we're just going to measure. And I will use three times what I need. Three times to fit and cut it. Now to sew in our signature, I'm going to start on the inside 
and go through all of the pages and through the center hole of my signature. Let's get this out of our way. So we've gone there and through the center. And I'll leave about this much here so that I've got enough room. Uh, the signature is the pages. I just see a question popping up there. The signature is the actual pages that are in the book. So sometimes I will have, so this here is a collection of pages that I'm sewing together to make one signature. Some of my books will have three or four different signatures that will all get sewn into the cover or into the journal separately. So each collection of pages, each little booklet of pages is a signature. So now we've gone all the way through this, the middle hole, we're gonna sew up and then we're gonna come back down, go all the way to the bottom, back to the middle and tie them together. There are so many different ways to sew your signatures into your book. This is one of the ones that I like the best because I find it has the cleanest lines at the end. And just keep going all the way up. Hopefully everybody can see that. There we go. Now I am giving away a door prize uh, today and the door prize is the kit to make this traveler's notebook it has all the instructions that you need along with the measurements and there is a video tutorial for the full for the full uh traveler's notebook on our youtube so you can check that out you can also reach out to me at any time if you ever have any questions i love to answer questions i love to help people get creative and uh, journals and art is a huge passion of mine. My son, who's six years old, Sean, he has a journal. He's an art journal. And he will write in it. Last summer, we put together a summer traveler's notebook. And he just wrote and drew pictures. And we stuck photos of all the different things he did all summer. I think it's amazing. Then I've got that forever. And I don't have to worry about sitting down later and trying to put together an album of our summer. It's already done as we go. So now that we've reached the bottom, I'm just going to come back up. So what I'm doing is I don't like the skip stitch look in my journals. Some people do. I do not. So what I'm doing now is we're just going back up so that we fill those in. And then we'll come back, same with on the outside. I want a solid line. I'm not going for the skip stitch look here. And then come back up. So now, now we're at the end. So here, we're just gonna pull everything, make sure everything's really tight. I'm going to thread, put my, hook, my needle through this very first stitch I made. And that's going to close up that spot there. Then I'm going to pull it tight again. Now we're just going to tie it all together. You could put a bow here if you wanted to put a bow. You could, I'm just going to do a double knot. And I'm going to trim my ends. And there we have it. So now we're all sewn in. And this is my traveler's notebook ready for my next trip you could also use this if you were doing a specific project or if you just wanted something little to carry in your purse to jot down your notes your thoughts your creative inspiration this is a perfect size all right there we have it so now it's all sewn together the signature's in there nice and tight it's not going to come out on me and we're good to go. That is our traveler's notebook. Now you can decorate it to your heart's content. You can put whatever you want on the cover. I'm just gonna move this back up here. There we go. So now it's time that if you wanted to do any decorations on here, you can. I'll show you this one again. 
So this one, I've just taken some of the ephemera from this particular paper collection and uh, attached a little bit on the front. I'll put the date of whatever trip it is that I decide to take. And that's it. You're ready for traveling. That's super cool. Thank you, Becky. Thank, Thank you. you. That's awesome. I know a lot of people have been commenting. We have a couple questions for you. One person wanted to know, what glue do you use to adhere? You had said something you use a glue to adhere. Perfect. So the glue that I use to adhere things onto vinyl is a uh, leather glue. I like to use a leather glue. Um, I find that I get a much better hold. I will also leave once I do the cover. So I'll make just the cover. I will glue the papers to the inside and overnight, or at least for a couple of hours, I will leave the whole thing under something heavy. Ah, just to make sure it's dry. Don't fold it. Everybody's going to be tempted as soon as you get that cardstock on to fold it right away. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> just wait until it is completely dry, score it and then fold it. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Another question is what do you mean by signature? So the signatures are the collection of pages that are in a book. Ah. So this has one signature, which is just this collection of pages that are sewn in here. I have this journal, which is one of my original junk journals, one of my favorites. This one has four signatures. So there are four collection of pages to make up one signature. Well, that is really neat. I never knew that. And obviously somebody else didn't either. So great. Um, I'm glad also, I they're asking that. the kit that's available on your website for purchase. Is it the same paper that you're using or would it be different paper? It is. It is right now. It is this same paper, which is from Victoria Designs. It is Mad About Sewing Collection. I love it. It's gorgeous um very vintage i mean there's sewing machines all over here I'm, I'm in love so that is the one that comes in this kit i do have other kits available that have different paper but it will definitely say in the kit what you're getting oh perfect perfect good now were you able to give us a little stu were you giving us a little studio tour or do you have time for that i'm i i'm not gonna be able to do it because i've got this on my computer i'm in the back of my oh. store so no this problem. is, yeah, this is, but I do have, um, so I do own Creative Haven, which is a general craft store here in Saskatoon. Uh, you can find us on our website. We've got lots of stuff up there. I specialize in journals and mixed media, everything. Perfect. Awesome. And I wanted to mention as well that you will be on Audrey Live next week. And I will. And you'll be joined by your son, Sean. And what are you going to be doing for us? So Sean and I are going to be doing some kids crafts and give you some ideas for what to do on rainy days or just with your extra creative children. I never wanted to play outside when I was little. I always wanted to stay in the house and play with glitter. So we've got lots of ideas to keep the kids busy and active this summer. Perfect, perfect. Yes, because it's been a challenge with them being off so long. So any help those moms and grandmas can get out there, I'm sure be much appreciated. So that's the plan. And we do have Creative Haven also has kids kits available that is packed with painting and brushes and shaped canvases and glitter, glitter canvases. So you won't actually get glitter all over your house. Oh. Just tons of fun things in those kits as well. Perfect. And they're all available on your website. They certainly are. And we ship everywhere in Canada uh, and awesome. starting to ship out to the States as well. Oh, perfect. Perfect. And we have your website just below there. So everybody's been able to see that as you've been presenting. And thank perfect. you so much. This was awesome. I learned so much and I'm sure other people have enjoyed it as well. So thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Absolutely. Okay. Bye-bye. Oh, that was very inspiring. I haven't done a lot of journaling, so it's kind of neat to see that whole process uh, go along. So uh, anyway, thank you to Becky, and hopefully some of you will look in next week on Audrey Live for her and her son, Sean. Uh, I'm sure that'll be a lot of fun. So uh, our next guest is Cindy Ohama. She's from Calgary, Alberta, 
and she's been a longtime supporter of all of our shows and just a fabulous person to be around. She has been painting, instructing, and sharing her love for art for over 26 years. Her love for teaching shows when she is in her shop, studio, or conventions, as she always has a smile on her face and willingness to help other artists enjoy their, her techniques. Cindy will demo for us today watercolor petite painting step by step. She will demonstrate how she applies the paint onto the rice paper and how the rice relate paper or how the wax sorry relates to the paint. Uh, it's called watercolor petite morning coffee. Enjoy. Cindy Ohama, and I'm going to demo for you today uh, some of my watercolor uh, batik paintings. So I started this little series here and I thought this guy I would demo for you. Um, it doesn't matter what watercolor batik painting I'm doing, uh, it'll have these painting techniques in them, might have some more, but uh, the ones I'm going to show you today uh, you'll be using in every single one of my paintings. So. Uh, you now uh, know how to wax since I demoed that in the last video and so now I'm going to show you how to paint. So let's get that started. Let's go have some fun. All right, I am inked and I am waxed and I'm ready to go. So I've inked using the thin end of my identi pen. I've waxed a few little areas of spatters and that's about it. I'm gonna start the whites of his eyes. So I'm taking about a number three round and I'm just gonna lightly dampen the whole pupil area of his eye and then I'm going to water down some of my cobalt teal. Now uh, one thing with watercolor paint, the more uh, paint that you have in with your mixture because as soon as you add water to these paints they activate, they come alive again, right? Because they can dry up and I can still use these 30, 30, 40, whatever. Years later they're good to go, right? So as soon as you add water to it, uh, you've got paint again, uh, usable paint. Uh, so uh, the more water that you have in your paint, the, uh, the lighter the color will be. The uh, less water you have in your paint, more pigment, the bolder the color will be. So uh, I don't want this too dark because I want his eyes to be a little bit more uh, along the white. <laughs> Whites than, uh, than having him look like he's got two black eyes. So I've got that cobalt teal in there. I'm just going to take the tiniest bit of black, like hardly anything at all. Black is so strong, right? And I'm just going to deepen that shading. I'm going to lighten that a little bit more. It's a little dark for me. Just going to deepen that shading area just a smidge. Now I'm not going to go over top of all of the blue that I just put in. I'm just enhancing the color, right? So that's the pupils done. As easy as that. So I've waxed the eyeballs, so they're now protected. So if I go to wash next to them, I'm not going to have to worry about getting them dirty because they're all protected so I can wash right over top of it. Nothing is going to happen. So if you are a fast painter, you could probably wash in all the green areas. I sketched this differently than the original one. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> we can uh, wash in all of the pieces all at once if you're a fairly fast painter. If you're a little bit pokey, maybe just do one or two pieces at a time. So the reason why you have to be fairly fast if you're doing all of the pieces at the same time is because the base color, that first color there, has to be wet until you're completely finished putting in all of the shading and the highlighting and the, the tints, all of it. The reason why is if it's dry, the color won't blend. So it won't move, it'll just kind of stick right next to the line, right where I put it there, right? It won't soften away from that line. So you want to make sure that that first color is wet before putting your shading color in. And then I'm going to put in, that was sap green. I'm going to take a little bit of mauve, pop that in the deeper areas of the shading. Just very light pressure too when I'm applying any paint to these areas. If you press really hard on your brush, what happens is you release a lot of paint and water really, really quickly, and then very likely you're gonna have a lot of bleeding happening outside of the lines. With that said, you will have bleeding happening on occasion outside the lines. That's okay, it's all part of the effect of, of the batik. Imperfect is okay. 
So that's the green bits and I'm just gonna pop in the beak as well before I wax. So I'm gonna wash that in with the cat yellow. And I want that fairly bright so I don't add a ton of water in there. And then I'm gonna take a little bit of the cad red light and just shade that just a tiny bit. So I'm gonna let that dry and I'm gonna go ahead and wax again. So I let the green bits dry and the beak dry and then I wax those uh, little parts. And now I'm gonna go on to the pinky kinda areas. And I have a lizard and crimson here. So again, I don't have to worry about getting any of those areas that I already painted dirty, right? And again, I'm pretty quick, so I might do the entire pink area, but uh, if you don't think you're fast enough, then definitely don't do that. You need to make sure all of those colors are in while that first color is still wet, right? So doesn't hurt to do just a couple. I'm just impatient. Okay, so that was the Lizard and Crimson. I'm gonna go into a little bit of mauve. Very light pressure, right? The thing is, is you can always add more, but it's very hard to, it's harder to take the paint out, right? So if you did happen to put a little bit too much paint down and it started to bleed or uh, you just didn't like how strong it was, what you can do is just press Let's say this uh, little wing here, I didn't like it so much. What you can do is just press into the paper towel underneath and it just lightens. You can see how much lighter this wing is now than the first one. So and you can press a few times to get it lighter and lighter and you can even dampen it lightly uh, to, to soften that color even more. So there are ways of fixing up things. Okay, so that's the mauve and then I'm gonna go on to black. Remember black is really strong. Use a small brush. I use very small rounds in uh, in these little paintings. You don't need anything huge. The bigger the brush, the faster the paint comes out of it and you end up with, again, uh, bleeding happening because you're releasing a ton of paint and water onto your surface, right? So I have like number two, number three rounds. Those are good. Then I'm gonna go into cad yellow and that's for the highlight. So I'm just gonna pop this in anywhere that there's no shading. I would not put this on top of a shading area because then you just eliminate the work that you did, right? So that's that uh, bit of pink. Let that dry and wax it. So I have everything else waxed now. So I'm on to the blue bits. I'm using some cobalt teal here. And again, see all of this is waxed. You can just make a mess over top of it and nothing is going to happen. So it's all protected. And again, I'm gonna do all my little blue bits on this guy. Cobalt teal. So I'm just using a number two round right now. And I'm gonna go into mauve. I'm just gonna shade the bottom sides of each of those guys. Just let the paint and the water do the work for you. So you don't need to play around with it. You just pop the color in the shading areas and let that paint move and blend. So I don't need to worry about that softening out. It'll do it itself, I promise. <laughs> That's why it's done wet on wet. So it has time to move and blend into each other, each of the colors to move towards each other. See how I've made a little bit of a mess outside of that little uh, feather there. Uh, don't worry about it. What we can do after I wax it, what I'll do is I'll wet those two little areas and then I'll just uh, press that into the background uh, to soften it out. It might not be totally gone, but that's okay. So I'm all waxed and remember I pointed out where the paint was bleeding a little bit there. I'm just gonna show you how to lighten that. So I'm just taking some clean water, just a little bit, and I'm gonna dampen those couple areas that I wanna lighten might lighten this guy up a little bit too and then I'm just gonna press into the paper underneath see and it lightens those little oopses or mistakes the more times you do I'm just gonna move my paper 
into a clean spot. Wet again, blot, see? All gone. They're very, like very, very little showing anyways. Okay, so uh, now everything is waxed besides the little mug in the background. Uh, so I'm gonna start washing this piece in, in the Cad Red Light. I'm gonna use a bigger brush. Very light pressure, and I always start in the middle, especially with a bigger area like this. You wanna make sure that it doesn't bleed on the outside too much. So I've got most of my paint used up. By the time that I come to the edge, it almost feels like a dry brush. When I'm popping that in, I'm kind of scrubbing it in a little bit more along those edges. And that uh, just makes sure that we don't get too much of that bleeding happening. So I'm all washed in and I'm going to start the shading. So I'm using, first of all, I'll use a quarter inch uh, flat to wash that. And you can use a big round if you want as well. I've got a number four round. I'm just going to use very little pressure at first because uh, a bigger round releases more paint, more water. So I'm just going to pop this in really light and sketchy. I always like to shade really rough so nothing is too terribly perfect. Uh, that way I don't have a perfect quarter inch strip, let's say, going all the way around the whole entire shading area. I have some areas that come out a little further, some that stay close to the line. Give it some interest. That's the first shading done in the Cad Red Deep. Now I'm gonna go in with a smaller round, so about a number two round, and I've got mauve happening here. And I'm gonna deepen that shading again. I'm not gonna come out as far as that first shading of the Cad Red Deep, right? I'm gonna enhance it. So I'm gonna go in the same shading areas, just way less and thinner areas, right? So that first shading came out to here, a second one comes out to about here, right? A lot thinner. You don't want to remove or cover up all that hard work. Like I said, just want to enhance it. So the more water I have in my brush, the wider or the more the paint will blend. So the further out it'll come away from that first line that you start shading in. So I added a little bit more water in my brush coming down into the cup because it's a heck of a lot bigger, right? I've got a lot more space to have that color come out and blend. So if I want a more defined area, I'll go into my paint and just add more pigment, less water. And that way I'm able to control that a little bit better so that that shading stays a little closer to the line, a little more defined. Now remember, each of these colors will continue to move as the color sets up, right? Because this is really wet. Now, if you're a slower painter, remember you can do one piece at a time. So you could do the inside of the mug separately than the body and the handle. So you want to wash in, get all the shading done on one piece. Shading, highlighting, everything. Get it all done on one piece and then move on to the next one. So cool. Love it. Okay. I'm very happy with I'm loving this color, it's just making me happy. All right, and then very last color on that is the Cad Yellow Pale. And I'm just gonna be bomb that through the middle. I've got this really quite watery because I know I'm in the middle of the cup so I can put lots of water in this so that it moves away from the initial place that I put it, right? So maybe the area in the handle here, I will have a little less water in my brush so that it doesn't bleed outside of the cup too much. And then a little bit in the middle here too. Loving that. And just because we have time, I'm gonna put a little bit of the, <laughs> you can always perfect your painting the more and more times that you do it, right? I'm gonna put Cad Yellow with a sap green. I'm just gonna throw a little tint in here 
a couple little spots just to add one more. Oh, I love it. Okay, so I'm gonna let that dry really dry before I wax it, right? Wax won't uh, stick to wet paint. So make sure that dries really good and then wax that and we've got the background left to do. How exciting. So I am totally waxed. Everything that I have painted has wax on it, so it's protected. I have a fine mist spray bottle that uh, is just filled with water and I'm going to spritz that. So I want it damp, but I don't want it drenched. And I'm working on top of parchment paper this time instead of paper towel. And I have got a bigger round or a flat. And any of those areas, see that have gone over, I can either press those out to lighten them or I can just go over top of them with a little bit of the background color. So the more water that I have in my brush, the more that color is gonna blend away from the line. The drier that the brush is loaded up into the paint, the more it's gonna stick to that line. So I make sure that I, I definitely go over top. See the spackling here? I don't know if you can see that yet. But once I put paint over it, I spackled that in the very beginning with wax, so the paint won't take there, right? So you'll be left with little polka dots. And I ground this as well. There's some more wax there. Okay, and then I'm gonna deepen that, so that was cobalt teal, and I'm gonna go in with the turquoise. A little bit drier so a little less water I'm just gonna go into the same shading areas just gonna enhance those a little bit and then I'm gonna let those areas set up let's get some turquoise over the spackle there we go now you can see it look at that Okay, really loose. You don't want to ever put this in just by brushing a straight line. Just really just kind of sketch it in. All right, we're gonna let that set up. Okay, so there's one more little thing to do on the background here. I'm gonna load a round brush. I've got a number four round here. And I've got that loaded up in the cobalt teal. And I'm just gonna flick a few little, a little less water in there. There we go. It was a little too watery before, so it was bleeding out, and I want that a little bit more defined. Okay, so after you've got that done, make sure that that's dry, and you're gonna wax the whole background, and then we'll be at this part. <laughs> so this one is totally waxed. Back and front, we've got everything uh, waxed and painted up. Now we're gonna work on these little cracks. See all these little rustic uh, little bits? Love those. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna take your finished paint and you're just gonna crumple that up in a ball. And then you're gonna just shake that out. Usually I would do this over top of a garbage can, but just try to keep it from making too much of a mess, <laughs> otherwise you have wax all over the place. But you want a brush as well that you're just gonna be using for this part. Uh, you wouldn't wanna go put this back into your, your paint on your palette, because it will ruin the paint. It'll start adding wax to it. So I just use a little jar and I've got here sepia and a little bit of Payne's Gray. And I'm just gonna wash in a little area that I want some cracks on. And then I'm gonna re-crinkle that little area. And then I'm gonna just dab that with paper towel to see what's left over. You can see I have some cracks here. I want a little bit more than that though. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Now you wanna do that over top of the painting as well as the background. This is a little bit unpredictable. Uh, what happens, happens kind of thing. You can soften them a little bit by adding water if you have a, a huge area that you absolutely hate, let's say. <laughs> But a lot of times the big ones look cool too. See, these guys are bigger. Oh, that looks neat.
Last step, everybody. So I have my newspaper on underneath, and then I have my paper towel. I have my painting. I have another piece of paper towel, and then one ply newspaper on top. And I have my iron, nice and hot, ready to go. And I'm just going to warm up that wax and release it into the paper. So you don't want to use glossy ads, you can use anything else, it can be color, just as long as it's not glossy. What I'm doing, see I'm heating that up so that the paper sucks up all that wax because we don't need it anymore. Oh, now this is the exciting part. <laughs> the unveiling. Look at that, the colors just pop like crazy. So after that you're going to take more newspaper. Just a newspaper this time. The wax, uh, sorry, the paper towel doesn't take out everything, so I just use the newspaper after that. The colors just pop huge with that little bit of wax that stays in there. So you can do this a few times until there's no more wax left in your painting. So it might take a few times. Heat it right up and you'll want to mount this piece on white because oh look at those colors just popping huge. So another thing I just wanted to show you, this piece has not got wax, wax on it. This piece does. So you can see the difference in the oranges, right? So that's one good reason why we have the wax in there. Thank you so much for joining me. That was a blast. Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. That was a blast. Uh, I can remember uh, at Artways West last year coming into her class when she was doing this technique and everybody was painting and it looked so amazing throughout the day and it was like a four or six hour class. And then I can remember coming in and everybody was crumpling their artwork and it was just that fear in my eyes, like, what are they doing? And I'm sure some of the students in the class, and I know a couple of people mentioned it as well uh, on the uh, the Facebook chat there. So, but of course, just as she showed us, it, it just looks amazing afterwards. And those colors are amazing. So uh, just wanted to mention to a lot of people want to see part one of that video, which is uh, the waxing technique. It's called, What's the Wax All About? And that was on our Audrey Live May 28th show so you can see that on YouTube and we will also upload, ju upload just that segment as well so we will be doing that this weekend so people can just go right to our YouTube and see just Cindy's video so you can see part one so uh, thank you Cindy again and uh, moving along our next guest uh, she's an extremely talented always a pleasure to be in our company and every time you see her you're just like oh she's just so adorable she is Holly Hanley. Uh, Holly is from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. She's the author of the decorative painting series called Sunshine Kisses and Warm Wishes. She, she has published numerous pattern packs and combined author books. She is best known for her textured bears, which we love all your textured bears and whimsical characters, but also Holly's designed a lot of European themed pieces as well. She's been teaching for 25 years. Again, this is another one I can't believe you've been teaching Holly for 25 years. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Welcome, Holly. And you have a little, oh, you have a little friend. You have a little friend with you. Who's your friend? This is my, this is my dog, Jager. Uh, hi, Jagger. <laughs> hi, Jagger. <laughs> well, um, so I, great, so great to have you with us. You're live. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I gotta say, Audrey, you're just amazing for having all these artists come together and bring some happiness and creativity to the world. So, thank you so much. Well, we're just so fortunate that we have so many talented, creative people like yourself that you know, are willing to come forth and, and share everything that you have, especially at this time, all these people are home and they just want to be with you and they want to watch you paint and, and show them how to do different techniques. So what are you going to do for us today? Oh, and I just want to mention that cute little guy behind you. We did, uh, we showed you, I know you have it on Facebook and we of course showed it on the show yesterday and we had lots of comments, your little uh, uh, video. You said it was like a 30 or 45 minute video 
and you do like a fast <laughs> painting. I've never seen anyone pa paint so quickly, Holly. <laughs> if, if only you could get that fast, hey? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was adorable. Really loved that. So, so what are you doing for us today? Um, I'm actually going to show you my signature technique of three dimensional bears. Um, so basically, I I've actually used these on a lot of projects, and um, like I'll show you some of my little ornaments that I've used it on. Um, I like using it on the glass blocks. So there's a little glass block has like the texture on it. So you can actually use this on like wood or glass or anything. So it's it's really versatile. And it Perfect. just gives the, a little, you know, I don't know, three-dimensional 3D look. So brings the cuteness factor out to everything. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> All okay. right, we'll let you get started. Go ahead. Okay, sounds great. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to use the Decorate Snow Text. Decorate's my favorite company. Um, I love the paints and mediums and all the textures that they make. Um, so I'm just going to use a little bit of snow text and I actually don't add any paint or anything to it. I use it just as is. And then um, I'm going to be using my favorite stiplers. Um, they're made by Princeton and I actually worked with the company to make these and um, they're wonderful. So they've got a really nice spring to them um, and I use them for all my stippled bears. So anything that you see that's stippled, um, that's what's that's the brush that I use. Okay, and I usually use a couple, um, and I'll show you that in just a few minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this around and I'll show you my little project here. Hopefully it's not upside down. Okay, so um, this is um, the little bear that I'm gonna be doing. Okay, and I just actually had a base coat um, down, but you don't need a base coat underneath. It's just so that you can see it a little bit better when I put the snow text on. Okay, so and when I'm using when I'm using my um, stippler, actually to apply the snow text, I actually wet the stippler a little bit first. Okay, so you can use I've got a little quarter inch stippler. I'm gonna wet that, and it's it just makes the snow text stick a little bit better. So you're gonna take a little bit of that, and usually I start out on the ear, and you can add all of that snow text, and it's nice and puffy, okay, like this. So you're really gonna, you know, put it on nice and full, use lots of snow text, okay, and usually what I do is I just sort of pat it so that it's nice and smooth. It'll have lots of texture when it's dry, so you don't have to worry about that, but I'm just trying to get away, um, get rid of the little bumps. Okay, and then for the, that little ear, I just poke the inside of the ear to make that outside edge of the ear pop out, which is fun. Okay, and usually I try and use like the biggest stippler that will fit in the area just to do this, so it's a little bit more smooth. Okay, so I'm gonna start again just doing the back section. So usually I do those back sections first, and then I add snow text on those more forward sections, like the hands and the muzzle and so on. Okay, so you can see I'm just sort of patting it and I'm gonna make it a little thinner right here where it's going underneath that little frog. Little frog sitting underneath or on top of his head. Okay, so right in here. And I don't know if the texture is like really showing up on the camera, I don't know if you can see that, but basically um, I'm just sort of patting it like this, but it's still got lots of snow text on there, so it's gonna be nice and puffy when it's dry. Okay, and the great thing about snow text too is that it doesn't shrink um, a whole lot, so if at all, so it's really nice. So what you see on your piece is what you're gonna get after. Okay, like this. Okay, and again, I don't add any raw sienna or any color to it, um, just because that thins it. And then um, it sort of levels out a little bit. It doesn't hold its shape quite as well. So I don't add any paint to it. I just use it as is, like this. And you would do the other little ear. Okay, and the more you do this, the easier it gets. Okay, but I, I actually really like um, doing this on glass blocks too, just because it's so opaque and the light won't shine through, which is nice. So once you put on all this texture, okay, and then of course you just poke the center of the ear and it makes that edge pop out. 
Okay, and then we're gonna add some on the muzzle. And usually what I do um, is I go around, if there's a mouth, um, I'll go over the, the nose. So I'll just paint the nose right on top of the texture. Like this. Okay, so I have, I have actually the face that's drawn on already um, with the mouth. And I'm gonna go over the nose. Okay, so I'm gonna really make that nice and puffy so it stands out from the back of his head like this, and I'm just gonna taper it down like that. So it looks like it's kind of going underneath of that paw. Right in here. Okay, so I'm just gonna, again, sort of taper it a little bit, but I'm not gonna go over the mouth. I'm just gonna leave that. Okay, right in here, and you, you know, you can leave this dry or you can use a blow dryer to speed it up if you're in a hurry. That doesn't affect it at all, which is nice. Okay, so I'm just sort of patting the muzzle. And again, I usually pat it really nice and softly, um, especially on the back of the head too, um, just to make it easier to paint those little eyes on. Okay, because if the snow text is really bumpy, um, it's hard to paint those little details on after. Okay, it's still gonna have lots of texture that's gonna pop out. It's just gonna be a little bit easier to paint on. Okay, so there's a little bit just underneath his mouth. And again, if you find an area, like even after it's dry, if you find an area that um, you maybe want a little bit more texture on, you can always add more snow text. So you don't have to worry, it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. You can always come back and, and fix it up if you need to. Okay, so, and again, I'm just using that bigger stippler again with that snow text. Okay, just patting it on and I'll just hold it up again. And I don't know if you can see the, the texture on there, but there's actually like quite a bit. So I like to really sort of add quite a bit of snow text, um, especially if you're painting at home. In class, it's a little harder just because we want it to dry. But um, when you're at home and you can leave it um, dry for a little while, it's, it's quite nice. So right in here. Like so. And then again, I'm just gonna really build up his paw so that it looks like it's, it's in front of his face. Okay. So this one, this is a pat, this is actually just a pattern pack that I have on my website. And I actually um, did instructions for this one actually with this, the texture bear and also with the dry brush bear. So there's actually, you could, there's two different ways that you can do this little bear. So if you want them to have lots of texture, you can use the snow text or you can actually do the dry brush method, which is, which is actually quite a bit different. It's using those, those lunar blender brushes. So, and I have a new YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to subscribe, I have more videos that I'm putting on there as well. So, okay, so basically you just sort of keep going. You can add that snow text. Again, I really built it up. You can see how much I have on my brush. <laughs> I like to use lots of paint and lots of mediums and, and um, I love glitter, of course, as you know. Right in here. And again, it's more rounded right in the center. And then I sort of taper it on the edges. So there's a little bit less on the edges. Okay. And then again, um, I put lots in the center of the, the tummy just to make it really nice and full. Okay. Nice little chubby bear. Okay, so you're just gonna push that snow text around. Okay, pat it like so. Okay, and this is just, um, I'm actually using the 3 8 inch uh, stippler brush, Deerfoot stippler. Okay, and this is all just acrylic paint and medium, so it rinses out with water, which is really nice. Okay, so it's easy cleanup. And it'll come right out of your brush. You don't have to worry. 
Okay. But it looks so cute too on little ornaments. You can use this technique on little ornaments if you like. This one has lots of texture on it. You can see the little bear, okay. And then um, again, just with those little feet, okay. You're gonna add lots of snap tacks again, right in here, like so. And I usually, again, I sort of taper it or, or use a little bit less around the edges, and I make it nice and full, sort of in the center. Like that. And I, I find that you, this actually helps to um, when you're painting because you can really see like the separation in between the sections and it just, you know, you kind of know where to put the highlights after. So nice. Okay. And the other foot is done exactly the same. So basically just adding that snow text, pulling it down. And so on. Okay, well, I'll leave that. And what I did was I went ahead and I prepped another little bear. Okay, so this guy, you can see all the, I don't know if you can see all the textures, I hope you can, but it's actually really nice and fluffy or puffy. Okay, and that's just with snow text. Um, and then, so what I do after that's nice and dry is I paint it with a coat of raw sienna. So all I did was I took my stippler brush and I just sort of stippled on a coat of raw sienna. It doesn't have to be perfect, nothing fancy. Okay, this is just to cover up all the white paint that's in that snow text. Okay, now if we have time, I'm just gonna show you quick how to do um, blend or the uh, stippling wet on wet. Okay, so. Um, whenever I stipple wet on wet, um, usually what I do is I use two stipplers. So if you don't have two stipplers, that's totally fine. You're just going to rinse it out in the water and um, just use the one. I like two because I like to have one with the base color and the highlight on it. And then the other one I just use for the shadow. Because if you ever mix the shadow and the highlight together, you get sort of this really dull color, which I, I don't like to, to see on my little bears. Okay, so um, with all my little bears, I, I mostly sort of stick to the same color. Um, I've got raw sienna for the base. I've got um, burnt umber and soft black for shadow colors. And then I've also got a little bit of um, highlight, which is camel. And then I used to use a lot of French vanilla. Unfortunately, that one's discontinued. If you still have it, you can use it. Or you can use some banana cream. And then also I've got a metallic just because I love sparkle, which everybody kind of knows, right? <laughs> you got to have some sparkle. So um, what I do is I just basically take that color. Okay, I'm going to stipple it and I just do, usually do like one section at a time. Okay, so I'm going to stipple this over just because it's it's wet on wet. I'm going to stipple over with the raw sienna like so. Okay, I'm going to do his little face too. It's really really cold in my basement today so it won't dry very fast at all so I have lots of time okay so while this raw sienna is still nice and wet what I'm gonna do because colors blend better when they're wet on wet I'm just gonna take a little bit of the shadow color so I always put the shadow in first and I'm just gonna take a little bit of that on my the toe of my brush so the great thing about these deer foots they have um, a toe okay where the longer hairs on the brush are and a heel so I'm just gonna take tip the toe of the brush into the, the burnt umber, and I'm gonna stipple that on. So the toe is, is pointing towards top of the muzzle there. I'm gonna add a little shadow. Okay, I'm gonna poke a little bit inside the ear. Okay, so every, every time I pick up paint, you're gonna pounce off the excess, and I'm gonna poke a little bit in the other ear. So anywhere where that shadow is, and the more that you pounce, the more blended it'll get. Okay, and right in here, I'm gonna add a nice little shadow right around his hands. Okay, and because that was so much fun, we're gonna do it again, just adding a little bit of that, this darker color. So this is just with um, a little bit of soft black. Okay, you're gonna poke a little bit of that in the darkest areas. Okay, so again, I've got some right in his, the bottom of his ear. Okay, right in here, I've got a little bit. Okay, but you can see how it's all really blending um, nicely just because it's the colors are really nice and wet okay and again you know don't press too hard it's just really nice and light I'm hardly you know I've just 
Got a really light hold on my brush. Okay. And you're gonna poke a little bit in the center of that ear. And then basically we're gonna use that other brush. Now, if you don't have two stiplers, just rinse this one out and then dry it off. Okay, but basically I'm gonna use this other brush. Oops, so I'm gonna use that with the raw sienna. So just poke it in the raw sienna to load. Okay, and then once I have that brush on or color on, I'm just gonna take a little bit of the camel and pounce. Again, I always blend it into my brush, okay? And then the toe of the brush is going to go in the brightest area. So you can see there's a nice little highlight just right along the top of the bear, right along and the top of his muzzle, okay? And you wanna pounce really nice and light. And you don't wanna, you know, over pounce um, just because you'll lose all of that raw sienna and then basically it'll just kind of turn into one color. It'll it'll really overblend and your your bear won't look quite as fluffy. Okay, so again when I pick up the paint, I just pick it up like this, pounce off the excess, and just see how light I'm holding my brush right in here. Okay, and then around the edge, don't be afraid to go onto the edge of your your picture. Like this okay on his little ear and then of course the muzzle. Okay, again, pounce off the excess, like so. Okay. And usually what I do too when I'm pouncing is um, I'll do, instead of going like across in a nice straight line, what I'll do is just kind of here and there so it looks a little bit more natural. Okay, so that you don't get a line. Now, if you do happen to get a line in between where the the highlight and the shadow um, end. What you can do is even just take a clean brush and just go over top of that little section and it'll blend right away. So, nice little trick, okay? And then basically, um, once you've got that nice highlight on, and I like to make the, like, the back of his head really nice and bright, just so that the eyes show up really nice. Okay, so this, this area is always the brightest. Okay, and then I'm gonna take a little bit of that banana cream. Again, I don't even rinse my brush. I'm just gonna take a little bit of that and pounce that in just to highlight. Okay, right in there. Okay, so top of the muzzle, I'm gonna highlight. I love stippling, it's so much fun. Okay, right in here. All right. And then you do all of the areas the same. So again, I just kind of, you can clean your brush just by wiping it on a paper towel. Okay, and again, all every section is done the same. So basically you start with that raw sienna layer. Um, this is just to basically put down a little bit of moisture and for something to the, for the other colors to blend into. Okay, and then you're going to put this, and again, if you're sort of a quick painter, you can probably do a few sections at a time. That looks incredible, Holly. Very neat. Looks like you're speed painting there. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> but all, all of those sections are all done the same. So you just start with the same thing, the raw sienna, and then just kind of highlight or shade first and then highlight. And, and then you can put on your little details. And then that metallic gold, it just goes on when the bear is dry. I just put a little bit in the highlight section. So, oh, but um, yeah. We have a couple That's of questions you do those for you. Uh, one was, uh, how long does it take for the snow text to dry? Well, it depends on how, how uh, thick that you make it. <laughs> a lot of times what I'll do is I'll put on the snow text and I'll just go do something else for a little while. So like some... Sometimes it can take like half an hour to an hour to dry. Um, if you're just gonna let it dry um, on its own, um, but you can you can blow dry it to speed it up. Okay. So and that that really helps. So oh yeah, perfect. And is it hard to put the paint over the snow tax? No, not at all. I not I at think all. It's, no, I think it 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 goes right over top. Goes so, right over top. The, awesome. The they work really well. So they're really nice and they get into all the little grooves of the snow text. So good, good. Great. And they said, does the snow text ruin your brushes? Like, do you have certain brushes you just use with the snow text? No, no. I've used these like hundreds of times and they still look great. So just um, rinse them out in your water and you can clean them in brush cleaner and they're, 
they're good to go. So it's really and what kind of, and what kind of brush was that again? It what what type of brush um, was it? This is the Princeton Select um, uh, Deerfoot. So and they usually I use like the quarter inches the most. But the one that I use the most. And then I, I was using the three eighths just for this bear because it was a little bit bigger, but you can use, you know, any of those sizes, one eight, quarter inch, three eighths. So all of those. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And you were giving a bit of a promotion today for anybody watching for the five hours. Yes. I believe it was 20% off any of your e-packets. Yeah. And, and actually even pattern packs. So if you want to go to okay. my website, you sure can. So perfect. Awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing all that information. And, and we look forward to having you uh, with us again, I'm sure here on Audrey oh. Live. And uh, just awesome. Thank you for sharing all your information and your, your passion for creativity. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you guys oh. enjoyed it. Have a great, great afternoon. Well, we enjoyed you. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Bye-bye. <laughs> that's the wonderful Holly Hanley. We all love her so much. And I'm sure there's other comments there that she will get to, uh, to you as well, uh, after the show. So, um, anyway, our next guest is Anna Marie Oak and she's from Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. And Anna Marie is just, everybody knows Anna Marie with her accent and, and the different expressions that she has. She's an artist and designer who loves to work with mixed media. She is a dynasty brand specialist, a deco art helping artist, a Pebio product specialist, and a Mary Owen certified teacher. She enjoys teaching in her own studio, but loves to travel, teach all over Canada and the United States. And we know we love having Anna Marie with us as well. She loves showing her new products and techniques. Welcome Anna Marie. Hello. Can you hear her? Oh, hear oh your video, your audio, you have to turn your, we can't hear you. You have to turn your audio on. Oh. <laughs> it's the whole Zoom thing. Can you turn your audio? It worked the other night, so it's got to work today. Are you there, Anna Marie? Can you hear us yet? Uh, oh, she's going out and back in, perhaps. <laughs> so we look forward to watching Anna Marie, which hopefully she'll be back on in a couple minutes. She's going to be demonstrating for us a feather uh, this a feather technique. It's a feather painted using acrylics on a glass dish and resin to protect the painting. Uh, just also want to remind everybody that uh, when you comment uh, on the different segments, so every uh -huh. segment you count comment on, uh, you'll be put in the draw. We are notifying uh, the draw winners after each segment. So if you haven't got that message yet, sorry keep commenting you'll uh you'll get in on the next segment so for each segment comment ask questions and then you will be put in the draw and we will notify you after so can you hear us Anna Marie hi hi how are you good how are you awesome so awesome welcome we are so excited to have you with us oh I'm so excited to be here I maybe I'll Press it down a little bit more so you can see me better. Perfect. Well, okay. we're going to get you right started here. So what? You, let them know what you're demonstrating here today. Okay. I'm going to be demonstrating my branches and feathers on a dish plate and also resin. So we're going to get started. Uh, I use any kind of dish or uh, porcelain plate. So I'm going to leave that one there. I'm going to bring this one. We're going to be demoing on, on this one here. And we're going to get our colors ready. Uh, we're going to begin with lamp black, first of all, and Stecco Art, American, of course. And uh, the midnight blue, which is a great, great color for feathers and branches. And I'm going to be using the Deco Art um, Extreme Sheen. And this is a pewter. It's a very nice soft color. So we're just bringing our colors around our palette. And of course, the white and Americana deco art. There you go. So those are our colors. Keep that out of the way so you can see. And I'm going to be doing it on this plate for you, okay? Just to show you that 
you can use any size or this is a smaller plate that I had to recently did too and it's quite cool. Okay, so we're gonna begin with our, uh, I'm a Dynasty brand specialist and uh, proud to be one of course, along with the Deco Art Hel Helping Artist. And we're gonna be using our Black Silver by Dynasty, our rakes in the half inch, five eighth and quarter. Uh, they come three, I sell them three in a pack, and they're on my website, animarioakdesigns.com, and they're really cool. It's a technique, okay? So I'm going to begin with my half-inch brush. I'm going to wet my brush. I'm going into my darkest color first, which is black, and into the blue, the midnight blue. Dirty brushing all the way, okay? I'm going to... Make a, not a happy face, but like a grin. Let's do a grin on our palette, okay? Or on our plate, just like that. I'm then going back and loading, reloading. No water now, okay? I'm just going reloading with the deep midnight blue and a little touch of the black to make it a little dark. And I'm going to begin by making my, branches first for my tree and you can see how I'm just holding my brush perpendicular to my surface and that's blue I'm going to add a little bit of white to my dirty brush there you go you can see how really nice and fluffy will make the trees I'll continue to reload and I will add more trees there you go to my plate, coming down in height almost. I don't want them all to be uh, too even. We, we like a little bit of a variety, okay? Variety is a spice of life, they tell me, it's true. There you go, and I'm making those trees. I'm also using my dirty brush and going into that pewter color, because I do like that. It gives it a little bit of a, a shine or a sheen, it's beautiful. Into it, into the extreme sheen again. There you go. Now, at this point, I could go to my smaller brush if I'd like, uh, especially for the plates. I find it a lot easier, smaller area. If I was doing a big, bigger plate, uh, piece, I would do a, a larger brush. There you go. And add a little bit of white to it. I hope you can see me doing this. I think you can. A little bit of white here and there, and that just adds a little bit of snow. Here in Newfoundland, of course, we get a lot of snow, although it's a nice day today. A little bit of a mozzie day. We like to say a mozzie day in Newfoundland. It's a, a rainy, rainy day, but it's good. Okay, so I'm gonna continue here. And I'm watching my clock. Here you go, and continue on. I like the black color uh, added to my brush. It gives it a little bit of depth for the forest, okay? The trees, so here you go, add a little bit of white. And I'm just pushing down, not, not really hard. You don't want to push down very hard. You just want to just kind of tickle it around to make your trees. There you go. And they're Newfoundland trees, they're a bit... Uh, rough around the ears, but we're, it's all good. Okay, so now for my feathers, and many of you have watched me uh, many times do the feathers, but I wet my brush in water. I go to my black, which is my darkest color, load it up, and I'm gonna bring my palette in front of me, and I hold my brush perpendicular and twist, okay? And then I'm gonna make my feathery strokes. There you go. I start from the spine, which is that little grin that we made and went right to the very edge, little hairy strokes. I'll wet my brush again. Now I'm going to my blue. There you go, the deep midnight blue. Fully load, okay? Come to a clean, dry area and twist your brush again and pop it up at you, there you go. Now I'm gonna make my feathery strokes with my blue. And last but not least, I'm gonna wet my brush again. 
And now I'm going into the white, which is the last color. It's the highlight color. Hold my brush perpendicular to a clean, dry area and twist that brush up. Those brushes are so awesome. They hold a lot of paint and they really make nice feathery, hairy strokes. Okay, at this point, I can see I want a little bit more snow on my trees. There you go. And that's it. Okay, a little highlight on your center of your spine. There you go. Now, it's also very important to sign your piece before the resin goes on, okay? So I'm using a number one Black Gold by Dynasty, and I'm just going to load it with the black, and I'm going to just put my name here like so. There you go. Done. Okay. So you can see her piece is done, but now comes the nice part, the resin. I love working with resin. Um, I'm going to put this to dry so we can talk about our resin. I like the New Luster 55, which is by Circa 1850. I like the crystal clear um, resin. You can also use Easy Coat, which is another product that I've used and I've had no trouble with, or the Pour On. Okay, now in using resin, it's very important that you use equal amounts for this product. And the instructions are given to you on side. If you use another product, make sure it's very important for you to uh, read the instructions. Okay, so you have the hardener and you have the resin already. I like to use these clear plastic. Uh, just clear plastic cups because they have lines on them and that gives me a measurement, okay? So we put our glasses there and I'm going to pour uh, the hardener. I'm going to go to that first line on my cup, okay? And leave it there, put my cap back on. I'm then going with my resin and I'm going to go to a separate cup and go to the same amount. And when I say the same amount, I mean exactly the same amount, okay? So I kind of have to stand back and make sure that it's both of them and they are, they're both on the same lines, okay? on the cup, so it's exactly the right amount each. Okay, so I put that there. Now, I like to use just a plastic fork, okay? You can use the stir sticks or whatever, but a, or a knife, pardon me, not a fork, but a knife. Um, it just gives you able better to blend. So I add my hardener to my resin, and I scrape out from the sides, because you have to have all of your hardener and resin mixed in together. Okay, and I just leave my, I still got another little bit. Resin uh, expands, so it's very important for you to get all of your amounts there since you measured so equally. Okay, now I <clears throat> just stir it around and we do this for about a minute and a half, okay, or two minutes. And I don't whip it like uh, you would meringue, okay? I just <clears throat> stir, getting scraping away from the sides. I go in both directions. You will see bubbles forming, okay? And that's fine. Uh, if you whip it too much, you would have too many bubbles. But I'm going to show you a little trick um, for the bubbles in a moment when we. Okay, we've got about a minute and a half left. I'm going to talk to you about something exciting. Uh, I'm in my studio now in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, of course. And I'm going to start to resume classes back uh, starting Monday. I'm going to be teaching here in my studio again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings from 6 to 9. Uh, I will be putting out a formal announcement on what I'll be teaching on Saturday or Sunday. So I'll be looking for that on Let's Paint and Create uh, Facebook page or Facebook. 
uh, I will only be taking four to six students, okay, on each uh, given night. Because of the guidelines, we have to social distance. I can have uh, two per table diagonally here in the studio, and I'll follow all of the health guidelines for medical health. We are going to be moving into stage two, uh, they say the 22nd of June, and it uh, loosens up a little bit of our, our guidelines, and staying safe is the main thing, so I'll be giving more of that. Also, I had a pretty exciting thing come in the mail yesterday. Okay, we're down to half a minute. I'm timing, I'm timing. Um, I had my paint, Painting War magazine come in the mail. Many of you had subscribed to that. And my glass crocuses, there you go, was there. So it was pretty exciting to be uh, in this issue of Painting World magazine. It's a great magazine. Um, I'm also, I submitted a Christmas ornament piece, which you'll see in the ornament issue. So it's pretty cool. Okay, so we're still, and it's, it doesn't uh, be crystal clear as you're stirring it. Don't mind if it looks a bit, um, you know, not, not really clear, and that's fine. This is going to take all night, too, for it to cure, but I want to really show you some cool tips with this in a moment here now. Okay, another 20 seconds. There you go. This is so much fun doing this uh, virtual event today and uh, preparing, and it really inspires us artists, you know, to, uh, to connect. Uh, okay, there we go. I think we're good. It looks like we're good. All righty. Okay, I'm just going to scrape off my knife and lay it down here. It's very sticky, so you have to lay it on a paper towel. Alrighty, now is my, I have two plates that I, uh, the first one here I did just about 20 minutes ago before I came on, and this one, I like to see if it's a bit dry, uh, it's not really quite dry, so I will start with this one here and show you how to pour the resin. Okay, so I like to start in the center. And you can see me pouring center. There you go. And just like a thick, heavy line. All righty. I'm going to take my plate and I'm going to lean it down so it runs. See that? It's going all over the insert of the plate. And bring it back this way. And you can see a few bubbles. There you go. But don't worry because I'll show you how to get rid of that in a moment. Go to the corners. Make sure that you let it fall. Let it just fall down in the corners. There you go. You don't want a heavy, heavy coat. You just want enough to cover your painting, basically. Okay. There you go. It's coming down to the edge. And we're almost there. And there you go. We're down to the last final corner. Okay, and down That's this way. Amazing, Anna Marie. And we have, we have quite oh, a few no. questions for you. So I thought I'd quickly pop on with you and sure. uh, ask the questions while we're working. You're working on that last stage. Um, somebody was asking, how do you prepare your plate? Nothing. You just start with a. I wash it with soap and water. Uh, when I bring it from the store, but that's just a ceramic plate. You get at Walmart or wherever, just an okay. ordinary dip. Yeah. So they're just ceramic. Somebody asked if they were porcelain plates. So they're just ceramic no, plates. No, no, they have a glaze on them. So what the, the resin does is protects your painting, basically. So there it is. It's, it's done. But I just need to tell you this very important tip. You know me, I love tips. I had done these I put chickadees on them I have a lot of patterns also Audrey I don't know if you had mentioned uh, I'm going to be drying for two prizes uh, a set of those awesome brushes there's three in a set and a pattern packet you are but you'll be getting two pattern packets the brand new branches and feathers 
which what we did here, and my uh, free spirit, which is my feather one that I love. So you'll get two pattern packets. Oh, amazing. Beautiful. Set of, so two people will win the prize. Prizes. Okay, so Perfect. I use alcohol. Go ahead. Use alcohol. And sometimes you see little, few little, I don't know if you can see a few little bub, like bubbles there. What I do, I spray with the alcohol, boom. The bubbles just rise and break. Now, isn't that cool? Because as it dries through the night, it'll take all night, and I just lay it flat like that on a table. Make sure your table is flat, though, because uh, you'll, it'll t be uneven you know, as it dries hard. But there it is. It's done. It's completed. And uh, awesome. enjoy. That's yeah. great. Looks great. Uh, another quick question was someone's asking, uh, at the start of your feather, what, what type and size of brush were you using? Okay. The three in the set are the first one I used was the larger one because I started in the center of my branches with the larger tree. And it's a half inch. Then I went down to a five eight, and you could have used the one quarter if you want to. For my chickadee plates, I used the one quarter for the tiny little feathers on it. Perfect, perfect. And is yeah. the is the resin food safe? Like, could they use that to put food on? Is it more decorative? It's decorative, but I I sometimes do large platters. And I uh, use a piece of wax paper if I'm going to lay uh, a pound cake on it or cookies on it, I just or a doily or something. You know, I, I do that. But it, it's good in the dishwasher. But uh, I it's basically decorative for a decorative yeah, yeah. piece. Oh, perfect. Uh, and another stand. question they're asking: the twist that you did on your brush when yeah. you're doing that technique is that hard on the brush? No, not those brushes. They're dynasty. Nothing is hard on a dynasty brush. They're dynasty brushes. They're, nothing's going to happen to them. <laughs> no way. I also use my faux sable as a three-quarter uh, tooth one, two, for large beers and things like that. I'm going to be doing a, a, a gnome. Jill, Jilly Bean said, you should do a Newfie gnome. I thought, okay. So that's coming up this week. I got them just about complete it so you'll see that so anything oh. larger some, sometimes on larger plates and platters i use a three-quarter faux sable by dynasty this is these are my go-to they're all on my website uh animarioakdesigns.com and uh yeah Great. any questions awesome. yeah and we have your website down below and uh Perfect. yeah there was lots of comments so make sure i think i've, I've got most of the questions but just take a look and i'm sure Anna Marie will go back and and answer a lot of your your comments okay. uh, as well in questions. So, okay, well, thank perfect. you, Anna Marie. This has been thank awesome. You. It was fun. Thank you. Great. We'll have to do it again sometime. We will. We certainly will. Okay. okay. Bye, everybody. And good luck with your classes. Thank you. Bye, bye. All Stay right. safe. Take care. <laughs> That's awesome that she's at, uh, able to start classes, and I know. Uh, Lots of people are hoping to start in their studios again or, or with the online classes, which is kind of a, a neat opportunity as well right now. So uh, up next, we have a dedicated lady from right here in London, Ontario. Uh, her name is Nancy Kleiber. Nancy uh, caught the stamping bug in 1988 and has been teaching and sharing the love of craft uh, ever since. She's the owner of Stamp Art on Hamilton Road in London, Ontario for the past 20 years. She still loves the constant expansion of her hobby into metal dyes and mixed media as well. The magic is never ending as new products and techniques are continually available to share. Every time I go into the store, which is quite often, I pop in to say hi. Uh, it's always bustling with people and, and classes and, and just uh, always have a great time having a conversation with them. So hopefully they can open up soon as well and start those amazing classes. So Nancy will be showing for us a heat bossing layer technique using distressed oxide inks and clear embossing inks and powders. She'll be layering up different colors and trapping them with clear embossing inks and powder. So enjoy, and here's Nancy. Welcome to my pin it video. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Nancy Kleiber and I'm the owner of Stamp Art on Hamilton Road. We've been in this location 20 years this year. 
Today's project is involving multiple layers of embossing powder. And I want to show you how easy this is to get some beautiful multicolor with a solid stamp and some nice glossy finish. Okay, let's get started. I've got my good 100 pound white layer and I'm going to work with some Distress Oxide inks. I have Wilted Violet. We're going to be working in areas of color, not stripes, not pin dots, just nice big areas of color. The overlap is great because these colors are all going to blend beautifully together so it doesn't matter where my overlap is. I've got some purple on there. I'm going to move to oh, I'm going to move to Salty Ocean. I just had an interruption and I hope you didn't see it. So Salty Ocean is a beautiful ocean blue. When I'm loading my pad, I really do want to get a nice amount of ink on here. Tap, tap, tapping is not going to pick up the ink the way dragging your foam is going to pick up the ink. I have peacock feathers here, a lovely green aqua. Again, you can see I'm really pushing some pressure on there and getting some good color. If I want lighter color, I can work off on my craft sheet. Now at this point when I've got all these colors working on, a piece of scrap paper is really handy so you're not leaving fingerprints on everything. This works whenever you're doing a, a really loaded background with lots of colors. Just get out a piece of scrap paper. It's not so much to protect your fingers as it is to protect your artwork from your fingerprints. All right, I'm going to finish this up with the peacock feathers. And I think I'm going to want a little bit more blue back in there. Whoops. I do have a foam for each of my pads, which will keep my foams clean for the next time I use that color. Just adding a little bit more blue, and I'm going to blend it out with a little bit more of the peacock. And I'll show you in a second. There is nothing spectacular at this point, except now I want more purple because that's the way it goes. <laughs> Again, the blends on these colors are beautiful because they're all in the same tones and they're going to blend beautifully. Okay, so here is my blotchy colored background. At this point, I am going to take a heat gun and I am going to dry that. If I don't, even though the inks might feel dry to the touch, they are still tacky. So at this point, I'm either going to sit it aside for an hour or so or I'm going to heat set it. We're going to move on to another one I have ready here and there is my background. It is nice and dry but even though it's dry I'm still going to use a static bag. An anti-static bag or anti-static pouch is just a talc bag and I'm really going to give it a good tap. I want to see I want to see some of that white powder and now I'm going to kind of shuffle the powder around and when I go to stamp my clear ink on top of here when I put my clear powder on it won't stick to the entire background. Because my stamp is fairly large this is what I'm working with from Woodware because my stamp is fairly large I am going to put a foam mat underneath when I'm stamping this is going to allow for a little bit more pressure coming up from the bottom as I press down from the top, so it allows me not to press quite as hard. When I'm inking up this stamp, I really want to give it a good coat of clear embossing ink. Right now I'm using WOW embossing ink and WOW embossing powder. Uh, great product and uh, something we use a lot. If you're going to be using a lot of clear embossing powder, I would recommend a larger jar. The typical jars are less than one ounce and this particular one is more like four ounces and it allows me to put it in a bucket and have a nice digging bucket for lack of a better word. Okay, I do have an idea in mind which way this is going to go. 
and I am just stamping with this clear ink. Again, still a fair deal of pressure. I know that this stamp has a little bit of weakness in the center, mine does. So I'm putting some more pressure there. Again, at this stage, we're just clear ink. So whether you can see some of that flower, I think so. Okay, I'm gonna move that aside, move my foam aside. And now I am gonna dip into my WOW clear embossing powder. I like working with larger projects. I like to have it in a bucket like this. I would caution you against using things like plastic spoons. The more plastic you use, the more static you're adding to your powder. Just another quick comment. If I were, stand, sorry, if I were stamping and embossing an outline stamp, Keep your fingers off of your card surface. That every place you touch your card surface has finger oils, skin oils, which are now gonna hold the powder in place and you don't want it there. So just keep in mind, when you're working with a layer, hold it more like a photo. At this stage, when I go to heat emboss it, I could try and hold on to that and heat emboss it, but it's super easy just to grab a clipboard. The, the heavy press board is great, and then I don't have to sit and hold that layer as I'm adding heat to it. I am in good and close, and you'll see a lot of heat embossing done by waving the gun all over the place. I don't find that to be effective, especially with an outline design. Uh, I like to just find my space, heat it, and as it melts, I'll move my gun on. When you're waving your gun around, you're more apt to overheat in spaces and underheat in spaces, and this way I can see what's done as I'm moving my heat gun along. And again, something like this clipboard is just ideal because it's not leaving a ridge on your cardstock and it's just a perfect thing for smaller layers. So there is my embossed image. If you can see the trapped flowers in those multicolors, it's still looking pretty choppy. But at this stage, I'm only gonna move on to another image because it's nice and cool. That one is still awfully warm. So if I were you at home, I would let that cool off just a little bit before you go in with the next step. The next step is to take Chip Sapphire, our darkest blue in the Distress Oxides. Again, I'm gonna ink up really well, especially well this time because I want that nice navy coverage. So right now you see blotches and a bit of clear floral. I'm gonna come in again my scrap paper to protect my project, not my fingers. My fingers take all the wear and tear. So at this point, we're gonna go in and add lots of lovely navy. And that's gonna cover up all my background and let my flowers stay in the multicolors. So that's the trick that we're working on here. And at that stage, you're now seeing the flowers set apart from the background. I'm still getting a bit of hue from the underlying colors on the navy, which is really intriguing as well. I'm going to let that dry for just a minute, but I am going to move ahead. Um, clear embossing pad again. I'm using an old, not older, I'm using one I've used before for this type of image because it's got mess on it and I'm not gonna worry about it. I wouldn't be taking out a brand new pad. At this point, I want to get a nice coverage of my clear embossing ink. I'm taking it right from the pad to the cardstock. And it's not bothering it at all. It really isn't picking up that blue onto my ink pad. I've got a nice coat of clear embossing ink on there, which is gonna hold my clear embossing powder in place.
Okay, we are gonna melt that. <laughs> Especially if the gun turns on. And again, you can see I'm nice and close. I don't want to put this on my clipboard because I do have to get to every single spot on this layer. Yes, it's hot. The heat gun range is about 550 degrees. And even though it looks like a hair dryer, it is a glorified paint stripper. So keep that in mind. If you're trying to do some heat embossing and your hair dryer doesn't work, it's just not hot enough. Okay. So there is our first layer, and you can see how the navy still has some hues of the color in it, which is very pretty, but it lets the flowers stand out. And at this point, I should let that cool just for a few seconds. I'm gonna race it ahead and go ahead with my clear ink again. Do the same thing we did just a few minutes ago. All right. Again, you really want that good coating of clear. The first coat is going to make it look more pebbly. The second coat is going to get, whoops, going to give me more of a glass finish. And you can continue. You can continue with three and four coats. The problem is you've got more and more plastic that's layering up and it becomes more and more difficult to attach it to things. I've got some hitchhikers in my, uh, their embossing powder so hopefully they won't muck it up. Get this at an angle where you can see it. Okay, I did a card earlier with just one layer of embossing powder and I want to hold up the two just so you can see the difference. This is the new one with the second coat. This was the first one with just a single coat and I think you can really see the difference. The, the first looks more pebbly, more linoleum floor. The second is smoother, more glass-like and like I said, you can keep building layers, but it's beautiful. So there is our card layer. For this particular project, I have layered the background to some platinum vellum. Just to pick up a little bit of pizzazz. What I wanted to show you next is when I've got foam tape on the back, this is great for lifting images and stuff. Our foam tape wheel is 150 feet for $15. We love it. But I want to show you a trick for layering this up. I'm just looking to clean my craft sheet. Okay, just like that. I'm going to take the tape covers off. Because I only have a 16th of an inch border on this card, Sometimes it's tricky, especially with super tacky tape, to get your layer to sit where you want it to. So my suggestion is one that I learned from Diane Reevely at Ranger. And Diane is so smart and takes a glue stick, and it can be any glue stick. This one in particular is hers, but a glue stick. And I'm going to put glue stick on top of open tacky tape. You can do this just with your straight layering tape, your flat tape as well. It doesn't have to be the foam tape. It's just the foam tape in particular has such a grab that once it's down, it's really hard to move it. So now I'm going to take it to the card. And I'm going to build it to my card with my 16th inch border. 
and you can see, I think, that I can touch this down and move it around, and that's something I can't do without that protective layer of glue stick on the tape. Nope, too far down. <laughs> this is exactly why you need this. It's just a cool trick to get into because then you won't be tearing your hair out every time you go to layer something up. And I'm still not square here because I'm doing, but look at this, look at this. I can take the whole thing off, please. Oh, you son of a gun. Anyway, <laughs> I can almost take the whole thing off, but just know that glue stick allows me to move it around a little bit. And yeah, it, you'll keep that in mind. My finish card. I have just added a few gemstones. I've added a bit of the platinum again and the silver die cut hello. And inside we've done the platinum vellum again and a little bit of a stamped off image and a, and a verse. So thanks so much for dropping by and I'm so glad you could join us for Pin It and I hope to see you at the store. Thank you, Nancy. That was very inspirational. Uh, beautiful colors, great tips, and many people wanting to know where they can get that stamp. So, of course, uh, your website was below, and you had mentioned it, so anybody can go to the website or call the store and uh, to get more information on the stamps and uh, also find out when you're going to be starting the classes again. Maybe you can kind of put that on there. I'm sure it's a, a process right now. So, And I look forward to coming to the store again and having a visit. And yes, I will bring more pens. That's just kind of an inside joke with John and I. So I will bring you more pens. <laughs> Our next guest today, uh, we're very excited to have this next person on. She was actually on our Audrey Live show uh, last week, and we so enjoyed having her. Natasha Watier. She's very, very passionate about her art. She has been in the design business for 30 years. During this time, she has produced several magazines, especially in the decorative arts, craft, DIY, and transforming and painting furniture. Over time, she became a reference in the field, which enabled her to grow this art in Quebec, Canada, and in Europe. Natasha was part of a team of collaborators for a TV show and has produced videos in collaboration with Desairs a large retail arts and craft show, a store, which most of you or a lot of you know of. She also opened her own publishing house, Lay Edition in Start, which I'm sure I've said wrong, but it's, uh, we will put that, post that up there, where she creates the magazine, Natasha Creative, as well as many books. Natasha will show for us today, new products from her art DIY and recycled per furniture called Natasha Creative. So enjoy. Thanks, Natasha. My name is Natasha Creative and you're in my arts and crafts studio. Welcome to everyone. I'm so happy today because I'm going to show you uh, my new line of products. I have four new mediums that you're going to be able to create uh, lots of things with it because it's preparing all your surfaces to receive paint or even uh, whatever you want to create uh, your pieces. So let me talk to you about all the mediums that we have. Uh, we have four kinds of medium and there's one liter of uh, the, these mediums and you can even have it in an eight ounce uh, con container. So that's great for uh, uh, the one that are very creative <laughs> and the other one that wants to try and test it. So we have four medium. The first one, the one that I love best and you're gonna use a lot is the decoupage medium. So this one is great. You'll see why in a couple of minutes. We have a matte uh, varnish that you could use like a sealer or even like a varnish. So whatever you want to do with it, this is the best thing to, to use and you'll see why in a couple of minutes too. Then we have a glaze and the glaze is, ner is natural. It's no colors in there. In there. So you could uh, put paint in there and do whatever you want, like full finishes and create dimension. And so you're gonna have a lot of fun with this one too. And the last one is the top coat varnish. The top coat varnish is the one that you're gonna use when you're finished with your piece and you want to uh, do a, a beautiful finish. And it's gonna be uh, even, you know, something that you're gonna use every time you're gonna finish all your wood pieces or even your furniture or your canvases. So let me show you what we can do with all these products. I'm so happy to show you this. So 
we're going to start with, let me see. Well, where, where is it? <laughs> okay, we're going to start with the uh, decoupage medium. This one is the one that you're going to use the most uh, because uh, that's the one that's exceptional. So why? Because we're going to glue everything with an iron. So this is really fun because you're going to be able to do so much things. And the thing that's really cool with it is that when you finish all the glue, uh, the gluing, gluing? No, I don't know if you say that, but I mean, when you're finished putting all the, the medium on the top of your piece and then you put the tissue paper or your textile and you iron it, the thing that's really cool is you won't have any wrinkles. So that's the medium that's extraordinary because no wrinkle, no texture, it's going to be very, very smooth. And that's the thing that's really cool for these uh, particular creations. So I think your imagination is going to be wild. <laughs> so just to give you an example of what I did with these, these uh, medium, uh, like if you could see here, this is a canvas that I've glued uh, my textile and then I painted a rose. So just to show you how it's beautiful to work with, you could even put paper tissue on wood like this. And it gives you this kind of uh, piece. So that's really great. You could even put it on canvas. This is a wood piece, but if you want, you could put it on canvases. So this is great. Like you can see, it's very, very uh, smooth. And we have nine different uh, tissue paper that I have in my collection. These are the nine different ones. It gives you an idea of what you could do with those, and but you don't have to use only this. You could even use all the kinds of, of textile that you want. You could use whatever kind of paper you want. It could even be like paper that you use in books, that old books. Uh, it could be a picture. It could be a lot of different uh, kinds of uh, mediums. And this one, because I, <laughs> you cannot iron uh, some... Uh, uh, this kind of uh, textile, uh, I've, I've put it in paper, so this is a good idea to do beautiful things. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's really nice in the back of all our packaging, like you can see here, there's all the explanation in French and English, so don't worry if you don't remember all the things you have to do. It's all really, really good the explaining uh, all the details and the instruction are there. So, so there we're going to start with the uh, the medium, the decoupage medium. And the first thing I did, I've put our already medium on this canvas, this oval one. And I'm going to show you how to put it on a wood piece. Uh, so you could put it on metal, on um, like a paper craft, uh, like a, car a cardboard craft. Uh, you could put it on canvas, on wood, and if you put it on natural wood like this one, it's really nice. It depends which paper you're going to take. But if you want to paint the piece before, you could do that again. Like put like um, chalk paint or even acrylic. And when it's dry, then you could put the medium over. So if there's papers that have like uh, different um, uh, models and there's like white on the background or it's like blue or green well you could even take the colors on the background of the paper to be able to do like different uh patterns and uh different i how could i say this it's like um different colors so you'll see I, i'm sure that you're gonna find my english sometimes i don't practice enough but still i'm trying <laughs> So first of all, we're going to do the other one with the canvas in a couple of minutes. I'm going to put um, my iron is going to be ready. And let's try with the medium on the, this wood piece. So this one is natural. I didn't paint it. But if you want, you could paint. Let me show you this one. What I did is I've painted the background with a very light gray. And then I did, I did like a stencil with a pink stencil over here. And after I've put my paper tissue on this side and this one. So you could even cut the paper where you want it. Like if there's flowers or different designs that you like and you want to put only these designs on the, on the, on the background, well, you could do it and cut whatever you want and then 
stick it on the on the piece. Uh, this one, the flower one, is the one that I like best. Uh, the tissue paper is very beautiful, so you could cut whatever you want in the mod the model of the paper, and then you put you put it back on the background wherever you want. So this is what I did here. It's very beautiful, and this is to put like some jewelry on here. So it's really nice, easy to do, really fast. This is the fun thing about it. I did different boxes here for sh whoops, shoe boxes. So here are the shoe boxes that I did with this pattern. It's really nice and it's easy. So that was the thing that I was saying. If you have ca like cardboard, this is cardboard and you could put it on and it works. So that's a another kind of uh, surface that you could use. I did it on a wood piece here that I even put resin over. So like you can see there's resin over there and this is my uh, tissue paper on the background that I put with the glue and the iron and then I've put the resin over so it's really, really nice. <laughs> and for the textile, what I was saying to you is this. This is one of the textile that I've choose uh, for this wood piece and then I added uh, a knob and uh, whatever. I mean, it, it's your imagination is gonna really go away, go and create a be beautiful things with there, with this. I mean, okay. So let's try. First of all, let me show you how to do it on a wood piece. I've tried a couple of times this beautiful paper. It's like an old uh, newspaper. And the thing that's really nice with this one is the paper. The background is like natural. So. Uh, the thing that's really nice with this is that the wood piece, all the grain that you see in the wood is going to be showing through this paper tissue. So that's going to be really, really nice. So imagine all the creations that you could do with it. You're going <laughs> to you're gonna really like it. So the first thing you have to do is to put some medium. I, I have a big bottle. That's why I use it here. But this is the medium that you're going to use, the decoupage medium. And then with a brush, you're going to apply all over the piece the medium that you are preparing for gluing all the paper or the tissue you want to put. So the way that you are going to um, put this, it doesn't really matter because you won't see it. The thing that's really important to know is that you have to put, if you put tissue paper uh, all paper that's really thin, you have to put only one coat of this medium. You don't need to have to put more. Be careful not doing a lot of texture when you're applying it. So don't put too much. You don't need to put too much. And you let dry completely before you glue anything. So you put this all over the piece. It goes really well. It's really thick. So don't, don't worry, it won't show. And if you have a, a kind of textile, a textile that's very thick, if it's not cotton, like really thin, put two coats. So you put one coat, you let dry, and then you put a second coat. And it's going to be better for you when you're going to glue it with the iron because or else if the, the tissue, not the tissue, but I mean the textile is too thick, it's going to need more glue to be able to be uh, all smooth all over. So don't. Don't put just one coat, just, but this, all these instructions, all, all of them are in the papers, in the background of the tissue and the bottles. So you could even put it on the, the sides if you want to put the paper on the sides. So I'm doing this all over. And then I let dry about 30 minutes to one hour. It depends of the air that you have in your house or if you're doing it outside it could even like diff uh, maybe in the time of drying it could be more than 30 minutes but it's almost 30 minutes to an hour so it's important let, to let dry everything so it's really easy and it's fast to do you'll see why so oops. Okay, so we're going to put this aside and wait that everything dries. 
And now what we're going to do is the one that I did a couple of minutes ago, just before I, I started the, the, the video. So this one is dry, okay? It's an oval piece. And I wanted to show you with, and, and I've put like two coats on there because uh, I, I'm going to put some textile on here. So this is my beautiful flower that I, flowers that I found. I really love this. I'm maybe going to paint something like I did with the rose. So what you're going to do is put the textile over. Look what kind of pattern you want on the, on the surface. And be careful if you want to put it on the side that it goes really, really well. And don't worry if there's like wrinkle on the tissue or the textile because it's going to go away with the iron. So don't worry. So put it on there. And then we're going to prepare the iron. I have a beautiful small iron that I really love. Let me show you that. You're going to find it really cute. So this little iron is so nice. I, I've, put, I've bought it at Amazon and it's really cool to do all your craft uh, projects. So it's not too big. It's easy to use and um, it's fast too. It, it gets really hot fast. So the second thing you really need is parchment paper, okay? Because don't take the ones that, um, I don't know how to say it in English, but papier ciré, that's the name. <laughs> so that one don't use, just the parchment uh, paper is the best for this. And then, oops, this one is a bit used, so let me get another new one. Okay, so you put it over and then you iron the piece. So it's easy <laughs> and you'll see, you'll see it, it glues really well. So you go over the piece and if you take a canvas that's not quality canvas, what's going to happen? It, sometimes it goes like in the middle like this. Uh, you better take a canvas that's a, a bit more quality uh, to do this, this, this piece or else what you have to do is take really good care of putting something under. Like that, it won't do any wrinkles on the on the top of the surface of your piece, because sometimes the canvas is not um, strong enough to receive the, the paper or the textile. So go and it goes really fast. Just be sure to put your iron everywhere that it glows. It glues very well everywhere. So this is what I'm doing. So if you see there's little places that there's wrinkles, you just go over and over and it, it's going to get off. You won't have any more. Okay. So wrinkle right here so here you go so this one is glued normally I don't do this over I need the parchment paper and then if you want to go and do the sides you could do the sides too so what I'm going to do is just take off a little bit of a tissue it's going to be easier for me to do it it is so fun to use so if you want to do like arts piece uh, for a big canvas and do uh, mixed medias on there and create it could be with textile it could be with tissue paper it could be with even paper uh, you could mix different kind of uh, uh, oops, here you can mix different kind of uh, uh, medium to put on the canvas or even on whatever surface you're using so here I go on the side so you could put the medium on the side and glue like this and stick with the uh, iron. So don't keep the iron too long on the tissue like this because it could go and burn. So if you're not, if you're not, if you go too fast, it's okay. But if you're not fast enough, uh, put the parchment paper over here because you don't want to burn or even get the tissue being yellow or even brown because this is what it's going to do if it burns. So you put over like this and you do it all around the piece like this. 
okay? On an oval piece, it's a little bit trickier because it's not, it's not straight, but still, you'll see what I mean. So you do this, you do this all around, okay? Like this. And it's fast, just a little bit of hot iron and it glues on the piece. So just to show you how it glues really well, here, here. look, it is glued on there, really, okay? So the piece is really, really ready. And now when you're finished with the piece, let me try to, I'm gonna show you on, I'm gonna go really fast in here. Because I want to show you what to do after. If you want to paint over the piece, you need to prep it. So, and the way to do it is to put the matte varnish. So the matte varnish has two uh, ways to work with it. it. It's a matte varnish that you could use at the end. But one of the things that I really do like to do with it is to prep my piece for painting. So everyone that does decorative painting and wants to uh, prepare the piece, it could be on paper tissue, it could be on textile, uh, it could be on whatever you want, you have to prep it before painting on it or else the paper is going to be wrinkling. So you, you need to um, prepare it for, for it and it's going to be great after if you want to paint whatever you want on there. It could be on oil, it could be acrylic, whatever you want to do with it. Okay, so my it's all done. It's all glued like you can see it. Okay. Then once this is done, okay, you're going to put that matte varnish. Let me see which one is the matte varnish. This one, okay. So we're going to take the matte varnish and apply it all over this piece. Now, this, this is a tricky thing, you have to know. Uh, do I have a brush? Okay, I'm gonna take the, the same brush. Uh, when you're gonna put some matte varnish on your piece once it's glued, you have to know that it's gonna wrinkle a bit. Don't worry, this is maybe the, the panic moment, you know? Everybody's gonna say, oh my God, how come it does that? Don't worry, it's not a problem. Let it dry, don't work on it, don't, I mean, don't, going over and over and over to try to get the wrinkles out of there. Don't do that. Just wait. Put all the medium over, I mean the varnish, the matte varnish, you put it all over here, okay? And let it dry. On this piece, it's not gonna wrinkle really because it's tissue, it's like, it's textile, it's tissue, but on tissue paper that's very thin, it's gonna wrinkle for sure when you're gonna put the medium there, I mean the, the matte varnish. And it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> That's the, the only thing that people could like a, a bit panic when they see that, but let it dry and it's gonna be smooth as the first step that you did when you glued the piece. So, and that's the only thing that could get, you could get a bit nervous. <laughs> so you put this all over, you let it dry, and then you're gonna be ready to paint whatever you want on there. So you could put acrylic, oils, whatever and then when you're finished you have to just put like if you want to put back matte varnish just because you don't like the the lust I mean not the lust but I mean the uh, varnish that's very very you know um, how could I say that the top coat varnish is very uh, lustre how do you say lustre I'm like <laughs> looking for my words uh, well it's very glossy yeah I found it <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't want a glossy finish, use uh, the matte varnish, but if you want a glossy finish, use the top coat uh, uh, varnish. <laughs> Sorry, there's sometimes my words are not uh, going fast in my head. <laughs> I don't practice enough my English, so. Okay, so this is a real, it's gonna be really nice. You're gonna be able to do whatever you want over this. You could put like what I said, like a rose or flowers. Uh, any kind of design could be beautiful on there. So now, I, with the time that I've 
I'm talking with you. My piece is almost dry. So you know what we're going to do? I'm going to take my, my air, my blow dryer, and I'm going to just dry a bit my piece. Don't put it too, too uh, close when you want to do this. You want to dry it faster. Put it a bit further, further or it's not crack or else the medium is going to crack. So. It's almost dry. So I want to show you with the tissue paper what it does. ready you're gonna see it's really green okay so then you do the same thing you put the paper over the piece let me just take this piece out because there's too much in here okay and you'll see how fun this is gonna be because I'm gonna take off the excess of the piece uh, the, the paper in a way that you're gonna find really really fun okay so this should be okay then i put the paper the uh, parts of the paper over this and then i iron the same thing okay so you iron the piece it goes really fast on wood you'll see it's even better than on canvas so i do this It is easy and you're gonna love this for sure because I'm sure that all the ideas that you have in your head now that you're seeing me doing this it's gonna be uh, easy for you to create so beautiful backgrounds uh, for mixed medias or even for your paint projects in art or even for wood furniture uh, like if you want to recycle a wood, a wood piece so you're gonna love this okay so it's glue like you can see, it's really glued. Aha, yay. So I'm gonna do the sides. Just to show you, I'm gonna do one side to show you how easy this is gonna be. And when I'm telling you that, if you want to put like the uh, uh, varnish that's very glossy on there, you're gonna see the wood grain on, on a surface. So it's gonna be really beautiful. You could go and see on my Instagram or on my website, I put a lot of articles, so if you want to go, I know it's in French, I don't have the English version of my website yet, but if I see there's a, a big demand, well, I will do it. So you could go on natashacreative.com and you will find different articles. And on YouTube, I, I have my channel too, so you could go on YouTube to see my different art pieces that I do, articles and creations. So, I'm going to put this one here, take a little scissor and cut it here. So it's really easy, fast, and if you want to order some products or even paper, uh, tissue, you can find it on my website on the first page when you arrive on the website. Um, there's a place where it's written there uh, that you can order the, the products. So you click on there and you're going to be arriving directly to the uh, website where you can buy all the products. Okay. So just to give you an idea what I was talking to you about, just going to take off this piece. Why I was saying this is, okay, so I'm, I'm still going to do the other sides. Okay. But I want to show you how easy this is. To take off after okay so if you want to take off the tissue paper on the sides here because this is glued on there like you can see it it's really glued so 
you use this uh, it's a sponge for uh, to you know to um, how do you say sable in English my god well I'm, I think you know what I mean <laughs> so you, you do this and it take off it takes off all the tissue really fast and it doesn't break so that's the fun thing about it so you just do this and it goes away really really easy so that's a, a way to do it so let me take off this little piece so I don't know if you see it but okay so this is the rest of that I'm, that I'm going to glue okay but still I think you have an idea what it does here I did it let me show you I did it on a canvas here and I took off all the sides I kept this side white because I'm gonna paint it so I'm gonna do a creative thing on there so I don't know if you could see it on the camera but there is a it's very glossy okay because I've put some oh you hear you that you see this uh, so why, why it's glossy because I've put the uh, varnish the glossy one it's the finished top coat gloss, uh, varnish I mean so this is on there I wanted to do some tests to, to show you how it is and it's very durable yeah I mean it doesn't you cannot take it off it's very very uh, smooth like I said no wrinkle no texture it's perfect so you're gonna love this for sure so just to show you again this little piece now it's ready it's almost dry goes really fast with the, the uh, uh, matte varnish that I put on there and I'm gonna be able to paint something over so it's great so thank you so much I hope I hope I gave you some ideas to work with these pieces I mean different pieces and different surfaces and if you follow me on Instagram or even on my lives that I do on Natasha Creative on my Facebook I do a lot of lives I know it's in French I'm gonna start doing more in English and you could see different things that I do with the uh, my products because I talked about I talk about them every week so uh, thank you and thank you to Audrey with pin it to uh, uh, gave me to give me this opportunity to talk to you about these new products and I hope you're gonna like them so thank you so much and bye bye <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you, Natasha. What a wealth of information. There's just so much there. Uh, I know many of you watched her last week on our show as well, and, and she just has so many amazing products, and she will be back on our show in a month or so just to give you an update. Um, uh, and as she said, and she promised me that she will be doing some of these YouTube videos and some of her Facebook Lives in English as well. I know I quite often watch uh, her every week on her Facebook Lives. Uh, it's in French, but I just enjoy watching watching it and seeing what she, the process that she goes through. And everybody's asking about the iron. Where do you get the iron? It's called Steam Fast and it's on Amazon. So you can look for it there. So uh, our next presenter is an energetic artist that loves sharing her artistic talents with other Debbie Cotton. She's from Port Perry, Ontario. Debbie has a natural ability to paint and design and, and offer lessons that feature a lar large variety of subjects, such as animals, vintage style trucks and tractors. We all know Debbie for her trucks and tractors, florals, mixed medias, abstracts, and much more. She has developed her own unique and distinct style that is easily identified. Anytime you look at a certain thing, you're like, oh, that's a Debbie Cotton. You know that's Debbie's design. So, And uh, she truly enjoys teaching and sharing her techniques with students across North America. Hi, Debbie. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> so nice to have you with us here today. Thank you for having me. Good, it's nice to be good. here. Yes. Uh, Debbie was going to be outside showing us her, uh, her, her um, boathouse, uh, but as of yesterday, we were looking at the wind report and uh, she decided to videotape it for you, but we're just going to have a quick discussion and you can tell us a little bit about it before we go to the video. Go ahead, Deb. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for joining in and thanks Audrey for putting on this event. It's um, pretty cool. I've been watching it a little bit on my computer. So um, everybody's doing a fantastic job. Uh, so for me, we actually um, purchased, it was a cottage that we turned into our house and we have a boathouse. 
And on top of the boathouse, as you guys start to see the video, I want you to remember that it was totally empty. So there was nothing on it. And um, we've transformed the space into something that I'm pretty proud of. Uh, I still want to do a little bit more because to me, rentals are never really done. <laughs> uh, you can always add more. So I can post those at another time. But I think you're going to really enjoy what we've done. Um, I think it's nice just sometimes we can't maybe always afford to go out and buy new furniture or um you know we can pick up some yard sale finds and sometimes when we do those things ourselves the diys sometimes they're we kind of love them a little bit more and when you're out there with your friends or in your space wherever you are you can always have a really good story to tell about what you've done and what you've created so i hope you enjoy what you see Perfect. And Debbie will be back after the video. So if you have any questions or anything, just post them on uh, on the Facebook chat there and we'll just do a quick discussion after the video. So roll the video. Okay. And Thanks. Enjoy. See you in a bit. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry that we couldn't get together for our annual London show. But thanks to Audrey and everybody else involved, I think this is great that we can do this live event. So my name is Debbie Cotton and I would like to welcome you to my um, coastal remodel. So I'm going to show you the top of our boathouse and I want you to envision that it was totally empty when we purchased our home. So I've switched my camera around to show you the top of our boathouse. So the first thing I'd like to show you are the rails. So the rails wrap all the way around the top and when we purchased our home, these were painted black and they were actually really weathered and rusty. So they needed to be refreshed. So my idea was to paint them white, keeps them a little light and bright. And actually when you're out on the lake and you look up, you really notice them where the black, it just, um, you just seem to lose it in the background. Also where the seas are, it used to be ours. So the previous owner was Robinson so my handy husband cut off part of the R to create the C's for cotton. Notice my nice little party lights that go all the way around. These look fabulous at night. The place is all lit up. So I'm just taking you around. So the next thing that I would like to show you is our cotton cabana. Just stand back here a little bit so we can get it all in. So there we go. So I went online and checked out some different designs and got some ideas. So we pretty much designed this ourselves, and I think everyone knows that you can spend an awful lot of money on a shed. So we um, had some really good little finds. The first thing that we did was we went to the rehab store. So it's all second hand items. And we purchased these sliding doors for $100. So that was a great find. I was happy about the doors being sliders because it gets pretty windy up here. And if we had a door that just opened, it would probably uh, slam all the time in the wind. And with the double sliders, it actually is really functional. It allows us to get our patio furniture in and out of it so we can store it through the winter. So notice the vent up top. We got it at the same, um, at the same rehab store. We purchased two of those and they were only $10 each. So super good. Now I'm gonna take you inside the cotton cabana. So when we renovated, our actually our house was a cottage that we turned into our home the cabinets in here were a bit of a mix-up that we um, ordered for our mudroom and they didn't fit so i suggested that we use them inside the cabana so we have a fridge a microwave i've displayed some of my um lake inspired ocean inspired paintings you can find these on my website and then there's this one it will be on my website soon 
I called it Lost Treasures. And here's a sign that we just need to hang still called the Cotton Cabana. So I made this just on an old piece of wood. So as you start to come around the inside, you see we've got a window here. It opens up and you just slide your appetizers and drinks right through for your guests. We had the window, so that was good. It didn't cost us anything. So now I'll take you outside. And the next thing I wanted to show you are the posts. So a friend had given us all this rope and my husband decided that it would be really neat to wrap the posts with this rope. I was a little unsure until I seen the rope and I'll just zoom in so you can see how cool it is. I really liked it. It's got like a little um, pinstripe of navy blue and red. So it just really added to our beach theme. So coming around, this is the outside of the window that you pass your appetizers and hors d'oeuvres through and maybe a few cocktails. So our shutters, we actually found at the side of the road and they were free. And then I really wanted to do a surfboard for a shelf. And once again, we got really lucky because our friends had this surfboard, but it was broke. So it was okay for us because we had to cut it anyways to get it to fit as a shelf. So it just worked out perfect. Then I went to some flea markets and some yard sales and I found these stools. So some of the stools were painted black, some were still wood. And with a little bit of time and perseverance, I painted them all white. It kind of ties into my little color scheme. And then I thought it would be really fun to do some stenciling on the tops. So you can find some really neat stencils, change up your colors. And it just dresses them up a little bit more. So I wanted to show you one of the stencils. Stenciling is really easy. You can Google it too, watch some videos, but I just put my stencil right on top. I usually put a piece of tape just to um, adhere it so it doesn't move. And then you have a stencil brush that you load with paint. So you load this with paint scrub scrub it into the paint and then scrub most of the paint off on a paper towel and then you just scrub your paint onto your stencil it's super easy you just don't want to have a lot of paint on the brush because if you do it will bleed in behind the stencil a lot of times when i stencil i don't want it to look totally perfect i like to um, create some areas a little bit stronger and some a little bit lighter Sometimes I'll even pick up another color and, and add a little bit more on top of one of the colors. So you can really play with these and make them unique. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is our bar table. So I really wanted to do a wine barrel I liked the height of it for the stools. So I went to an antique store and I found the wine barrel. And then I was super lucky. As I went through the store, I started to think, well, I really need a top for this. And I found this top, I think it was like $25. It had no legs on it and it was really not much use to the owner. So he gave it to me for a really good price. We sanded it down and I stained it with an outdoor deck stain, hoping that it will um, be, you know, it'll hold up really well in the elements. So all I'll have to do is just top it up again as needed. Some friends gave us the stools. These were like a black brown. So I just painted them, found some neat cushions to dress them up. 
and the um, battery operated candles look fabulous that night all lit up too. So now I'm gonna take you over to my bench. So a friend gave us the bench, good thing for friends. And to be honest, I wasn't too happy with it in my space. I just thought it didn't seem to really fit in and I wasn't too sure what to do with it. So I moved it around and got it sitting here a little kitty corner, which I kind of liked. And I found these cushions on sale, which I was really happy about. I really wanted to bring in a little more red. So the watermelon cushions and the floral really helped to bring in my colors. And now I love the bench. So I'm moving over now to my flowers. This is the first year that I put flowers on top of our boathouse. And I started to look online for some really neat uh, containers and stuff. And honestly, I could have spent like $500 easy. And that was just way out of my budget. So we lived at a farm before we moved here. And I went into the back of our property and found what I had brought over from the farm and repurpose them. So the milk can, I it was actually really, really rusty. I liked it, but it was a little too rusty for me. So I wanted to paint it, but I still wanted to keep a little bit of that rust showing through. So I'm gonna show you the paints that I used. I used Deco Art patio paints. They're great for metal, concrete, wood, all kinds of surfaces, great for outside. So I used gray skies and my other color that I used is daisy cream. It seems like those were kind of existing colors on my milk can. So I just really slip slapped the colors on and just tried to keep some of the rust still showing through. So I'm quite happy with the end results. I did some other flowers over here in the corner. So again, this big wash basin I had from the farm. And then this lovely little pot, it was here when we purchased this house. And it kind of inspired that Bahama blue color. And it also inspired my painting, which you'll be able to find on my website shortly. So it's the same pot and I added some flowers and dressed it up a little bit. So it's funny what can really inspire designs and paintings. So I'm gonna take you around. So the last thing that I wanted to show you is my big nautical compass that I painted on top of the boathouse. So I'll just stand back a little bit. It's approximately six feet round, so it's quite large. And originally I was kind of thinking, uh, I wanted something on top of the boathouse. It's like a big space up here and I needed to kind of do something to fill in the middle. And I thought about an outdoor area rug, but it does get quite windy up here and that would just act as a blanket and really just get blown away in the wind. So. I decided to paint. I didn't want to paint the entire top of the boathouse, so I thought a design would be really cool, something nautical. So I came up with this compass. And then in the middle, I painted the anchor. So I just blended these colors while they were wet. The red and the grays and the blacks, actually it was only one coat but the white did take two. I brought out the paints that I used. So I used DecoArt Americana Outdoor Living. It worked really, really well. You have to really sort of brush it in to the concrete because you can imagine how um, rough and porous it is. 
and I may not have had to have topped up that outdoor paint depending on what you're doing but with this piece being so large and all the time that I spent painting it I topped it with the DecoArt DuraClear satin varnish so this is a polyurethane and what I'll do is um, top it up every once in a while just to keep it in good shape so if you like this design you can go to my website I have it offered as an e-packet so you can download it you can enlarge it shrink it you can paint it on any surface that you like So there we go. I hope you all stay healthy and safe and you have enjoyed and I hope that I have inspired you to get creative with your outdoor furniture. Bye for now. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. That was so inspiring. That must have taken a lot of time to. Uh, well, how? What's the length of time for the pro the whole process? From like the nautical. Um, anchor. Well, just how long did it take you to kind of put all this together? How long have you been working on the boathouse? Oh, well, um, we did the rails first, and then a couple of years ago, we did the cabana. So, and then actually, I guess maybe not just this summer, maybe it was last summer. And then, and then after that, things kind of started to fall into place. And so this summer, I just really wanted to add some finishing touches with the flowers and, Perfect. and then the big painting. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Somebody was asking, Thanks. where do you, what stencils did you use? Do you um, so, uh, Lori Spelt. I have some of hers, the little beach ones, and then also DecoArt Americana. Okay. And one of the one with the weather vane on the um, uh, the bar stool, that was DecoArt Americana's. And actually, on their packaging, somebody had used it on a pillow, which is kind of nice to know. So you Very can use good. it on all kinds of surfaces. Yeah. And just on a different note, somebody asked, what are your water levels like? Have your, has your water come up there as well? Uh, it's pretty good right now. So yeah. just the average, yeah. Sometimes it starts to drop as the summer goes on, but right now it's good. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. And of course, they can find a lot of your information and your pattern packs and things like that on your website, which we have down below. And yes. uh, we've just so enjoyed seeing your your outdoor relaxing space. So you'll have to go enjoy it. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, take care. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye-bye, Debbie. Oh, I just want to go sit there, I think, and have a, a cold drink out in the water. It just looks amazing. Uh, definitely would be a relaxing place to go. So uh, next up, we have Sandy McTeer. She's from Middle Georgia, USA, and as a wife of 29 years to a U.S. Air Force veteran, and also mom to three amazing young men. Sandy's passion for painting and creating over the last three decades has led her on an incredible artistic journey. She is a published artist, designer, international and national travel teacher. Sandy creates a variety of mediums from acrylics to oils and clay to mixed media which is probably her most favorite, she says. Sandy is a proud DecoArt helping artist, DecoArt art ambassador, and in a DecoArt creative consultant, working closely with their marketing and product demonstration. Uh, Sandy is also a proud Dynasty brand specialist and loves working with the brush, the best brush company in the world, she says. She is also a chart pack art ambassador. Sandy, you can find her at many painting conventions and uh, around the country as well on Facebook at Sandy McTeer Design and on Twitter, Twitter, Pinterest and Instagram. And of course, we'll have her her uh, website down below as well. So she's going to bring us through a journey and art Journaling with Sandy McTeer. Hi, Sandy McTeer here. Welcome to my studio. So excited to be here with Pinnit Canada and to show you guys some of my tips and tricks on how to create an art journal page. Let's get started. 
Don't forget, make sure you comment below during my segment to win this product package giveaway. One random winner is going to receive all this happy mail. The Grumbacher Mixed Media Art Journal, four M Square stencils. This is a stencil line I have with my friend Tracy Moreau. Stampendous Vintage Note Stamp. The Butterfly Trio stamp set by Stampendous and four of my favorite brushes by Dynasty. Just remember, comment below, and during my segment, one lucky winner will be randomly selected to win all of these goodies. Let me show you how fun and easy it is to create this journal page. We're gonna use stencils, decor media products, my favorite Dynasty brushes. Oh, it's gonna be so much fun. My art journal of choice is the Grumbacher Mixed Media In and Out Pages. I love the weight of the paper. It handles the water and products beautifully. And I love that you can take the pages out, create on them, and then put them back into your journal when you're done. My favorite products to use in my art journal are the DecoArt Media products. And the first thing I do on my page is to apply gesso, either with my favorite black gold dynasty brush, a brayer, or a palette knife. The brush with some water in it is going to give you a nice smooth application of gesso. The brayer is going to give you nice texture. And the palette knife, I love the way it stutters when it goes onto the page. That creates some beautiful texture when you go to add the paint, the stencils, and the design. Here's a really cool tip. Take a brown grocery bag, cut off one side, and then you've just made yourself a portable spray booth. My favorite go-to to add beautiful color to a background is the Decorate Media Shimmer Mister. First, I'm gonna spritz my page with water, and I'm using the page that I put the gesso on with the palette knife, so you're gonna see beautiful texture pop up. And then I'm going to give it a little spritz of the Turquoise Shimmer Mister. And then I'm gonna take my big brush, load it with water, some quinacridone gold, fluid acrylics, beautiful color. And I'm gonna slip slap that here and there. And then I'm going to lift that up and just let it flow and move off the page into the other color. If it's not moving for you, add a little more water or a lot more water. And just spritz it, get it to move. There we go. And then I'm gonna lighten it up just a little bit by touching it with a paper towel. Love that combination of color right in here. And I wanna add some splatter of that quinacridone gold. So again, I'm gonna load my brush up with a lot of water and paint, and then I'm going to tap it over the handle of another brush to add some really pretty splatter. And then I'm gonna use a heat tool or a blow dryer to dry that, and we'll go to the next step. The next step is I love to add stencil designs into my background, especially if it's in a dark area and I wanna lighten it up a bit. So I'm going to load up my Dynasty Stencil Pro with the titanium white fluid acrylic and then wipe almost all of it off on a paper towel. Using a soft circular motion, I'm gonna go over my stencil. This is just a Punchinella stencil. In a few areas. Again, I like to touch it with the palm of my hand just to pick up some of that paint and let it dry. Another thing I absolutely love using in my art journals is rubber stamps. These are two stamps from Stampendous, Butterfly Trio and Vintage Note. They're two of my favorites. My favorite ink to use is Stays On because it doesn't bleed. I can paint right over it and it's going to stay in place. So I'm gonna load up my stamp Test it on a scrap piece of paper. Reload it, especially in areas that I've missed. And add that to your piece. So 
if I have any lines missing, I can always come back with an Idena pen or a little bit of black paint. But I like the imperfection of it all not showing up. When I add the script, I like to put that here and there and not do the entire stamp image, just to have a little bit of that script showing, like you can see in here. Now let's brighten up these butterflies. I'm using quinacridone magenta, titanium white, and carbon black. I'm also using a 3 8 angle brush by Dynasty. I love this brush, probably my favorite brush. Get it a little wet, load the toe of the brush with a little magenta, and we're gonna lay that in right at the base of our wings. Not gonna paint the entire butterfly. I love how transparent these fluid acrylics are. A little bit more. I'm gonna get a little water on my brush. Just let that bleed out just a little. And I'm gonna do that for all the butterflies. Now I'm gonna paint all of the bodies in with some carbon black, and then go right along the edge of each wing, right to the body with the carbon black as well. Okay, now we're gonna highlight it. I'm using a stylus. I'm just gonna dip that into the white paint and add tiny little dots around the wings. Now I'll add a little highlight to the body. Slide it with your finger to soften it out. Now I wanna lift the butterflies right up off that page. So I'm gonna use Payne's Gray. It's not as harsh as carbon black, and I love to use it for my shadows. A little bit on the toe of the angle brush. I'm just gonna tap it in right underneath the wing that's casting a shadow. A little on the body, a little for the antennas. And for the antennas, I like to put it on and then touch it with my finger to soften the look. I'm gonna do that for all the wings that are casting a shadow. Now I wanna add a word. I'm using a, a deco art stencil and I'm going to do a two-tone layer, a different stencil brush, this is a Dynasty half-inch stencil brush, load it up with quinacridone magenta, wipe almost all of it off. I'm gonna lay my word in place. Soft circular motion, going clockwise, counterclockwise. It's easier to add more paint to make it darker than it is to clean up the mess of it going underneath your stencil. And then we're gonna let that dry. So the quinacridone magenta is dry. I'm gonna reline the stencil up and then I'm gonna slightly shift it. Load my other stencil brush up with white. Wipe almost all of that off. Soft circular motion. This might take two coats to cover up some of that magenta. Let it dry in between coats. Ta-da! And I like to take away um, the bridges in the stencil. So I'll continue my A all the way over, 
same with my R, just to get rid of those bridge marks. I'm gonna load up a brush with a whole bunch of water and white, and I'm gonna tap that over the handle of another brush and add some splatter here and there, but not everywhere. Rinse out that brush, and I'm gonna repeat it with the quinacridone magenta. Now to soften the look of the splatter, let it sit for a minute or two. And then I'm gonna take a paper towel and lightly press. That's gonna give you a stained look instead of a splattered look. One last thing I love to do is give my page a little bit of a border. So I've wrapped a baby wipe around my index finger. I'm gonna run it back and forth into some Payne's Gray. And with my hand on the inside of the page, I'm going to add just a little bit right along the edges. Just look at all that beautiful, gorgeous texture in the background. Fun little easy, quick design. My finishing touch to all my journal pages is to give it a layer of Decorate Media Soft Touch Varnish. It's gonna protect your design and it makes the paper feel like leather. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope that inspired you to grab those brushes and paint and start creating an art journal today. Thank you, Sandy. That was incredible. Everybody loves journaling and uh, just a very cool mixed media technique there. I like the tape on the stencil. Whenever I go to stencil something like that, I try so hard to, to keep within the space. I never thought to put that green tape on it. So that is such a fabulous idea. Also, somebody said just a great uh, stenciling technique and also the layering of textures and colors. So thank you for all your wealth of information. And I know you were on commenting. So anybody else, if you had questions, I'm sure uh, Sandy will look back and, and comment and uh, answer your questions for you. So, uh, and also we will be doing the draws and all the draws uh, along the day and making sure that we notify people. So, uh, and at the end of the show, I will post uh, either later today or tomorrow, all the winners. Uh, so either on our Facebook page or on our uh, website as well. So uh, our next guest is a dedicated business person who owns her own business and is leader in the creative art industry in Canada. She is from Okotoks, Alberta, which is just south of Calgary, Kim Evans. Kim has a flair for bringing design ideas to reality. She is the owner of Emerald Creek Craft Supplies, designing, supplying, and manufacturing art and craft products. Welcome, Kim. Hello. Can you hear us yet? Oh, almost there. She is still she there. She is. Hello, Kim. Hello. I was just trying to get it to, I thought it would just come in and it had a pop up. So I was oh, making sure. Well, there you go. Out. You are here. You're live. How are you today? Alive. I'm alive. Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so wonderful to have you here with us today. Thanks for having me, Audrey. I'm really excited to be a part of this kind of first ever virtual event virtual. for you. Yes. And, yeah, Kim and is for most people, actually. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I said you've been uh, involved in many of our, our actual shows from the London show and the Alberta show. So mm -hmm. it's kind of unique now that we can actually have everybody from across Canada, United States, North America and the world can watch this. So it's just uh, really uh, unique. So, so what are you going to show for us today? So I thought what I would do is just show some really simple, uh, a really simple card for those who are now restricted in budgets and how to utilize what you have. So it just uses just a couple of stamps and this is for Father's Day. A uh, couple of inks and uh, digital paper. So Pam Brady had um, worked with us during COVID to come up with a line of printable papers. So you just print them off. 
They're set to go to a 12 by 12 if you have um, like the Canon large format printers and stuff. Um, just for reference, they are between $500 and $1,000. So they're not super expensive if you do like doing big prints of your own. Um, and you can have them print out full page or just scale it down so it stays a square. And it gives you an instant background. So with minimal ink, I was able to create a card. Minimal effort, it just took a few minutes. So I'm just going to show everyone the simplicity All to right. kind of scale yes. back. Go for it. Thank you. All right. I'm going to tip the camera. Make sure I've got a good angle at the table here. And Audrey, are you still on? Can you tell me if the angle's good? Yep, the angle's perfect. Thanks, Kim. Okay. Um, so to start, I used a craft stock um, from Creative Scrapbooker. It's a 130 pound weight. It's how I like to do all my cards because it's so durable. You can see like when you try and bend it, it doesn't bend very much, it's not super flexy. Uh, when you put things like stones on it and then give it that weight, it'll still stay up. You don't have that bowing. It will stay at its perfect angle. So they only sell it in white, which is fine because I ink it and do whatever to it. And it's very flexible. Um, so the next thing I did was I cut my piece of paper and for my finishing edges, uh, my sister once told me she's an art major and she, I was trying to figure out how, what makes the difference between her projects, my projects, why does hers always stand out so much more? Um, first of all, she is an art major, so I lose right there. But the one thing she did say to me is when you cut any paper, you will end up with your white edge because of the core of the paper. So the best thing to do to get the finished polished look is just to take an ink or a felt marker and just finish it up. So I'm just gonna come in close here and show you like that edge versus this edge. And hopefully you can see the difference. And when you put it against paper, um, you can really see, start to notice the difference of the white edge versus a completed polished finish. So I just take my ink. So the two ink pads I used today were distressed inks. I have the Vintage Photo Oxide, so something a little bit more solid, and the Faded Jeans Mini uh, Regular Ink. Um, and I'm just going to take, this is the basket weave. It's gray, but um, it's distressed gray. So it's kind of like a brownish gray color. And I just inked up the edges. And then this one is crinkle in blue. And I'm just going to, so it has, it's just smooth paper. Like there's no texture to it, but when it's printed, you can see it prints like there is. So it gives a really good dimension onto your page without actually having to do anything to it and I'm just using the faded jeans across the edge of this one uh, the blue is a really good one because you can see here how the white would show versus not showing that's how I get the more polished edge and so if you are a designer or an artist looking to work with me those are usually the first signs that I will look at in a project to see what your caliber is for your finishing project for those who don't know I'm Emerald Creek. Uh, I manufacture products and we have design teams that work, or designers that work with us. And then we, we will pull designers at random to do artist features. And so when you, if you want to be an artist feature, those are the things I look for is the finished edges, um, the variety, how many different ways can you do something. Um, I really do appreciate people who can span across different uh, platforms, but I also look for people who do what I can't do. And let me tell you, for starters, that's scrapbooking. I don't scrapbook, so if you have fabulous ways, that's a great way to be able to influence is to say, hey Kim, I do scrapbooking and I would like to be a designer. So pretty simple, if, for those who don't know what I just did, I'm just taping my back on, oh, and I totally missed it. I was too busy chatting. So because I missed it and I don't like that look, I'm gonna take my ink pad and I'm just gonna go over the white and just really get in there. I'm gonna use my paintbrush too. I'm just gonna push as much ink into there as I can because I don't like white edges. And I can't believe I totally missed it. I was too chatty. 
I hope you guys are getting a good chuckle. I want to see lots of comments when I get to go back and, and read laughing at the mistakes. So then I take my blue one, just tape it down. For those who don't know what this was, this is an ATG 700 uh, tape gun. I'm using the narrow quarter inch. Uh, there's also a, uh, I believe it's like a half inch. Um, but today this was the handy tool. I have three of these on hand. They have big rolls of tape, so I never run out. And in here, and when I'm doing these kind of events where I'm doing them live, um, I need as much tape as possible, so I'm not changing it out. Now I'm gonna put this on, and then I folded my one edge up because I just wanted to have that blue transition go right around my card. And then I have this piece. So I just stamped it. For those who don't know, I manufacture stamps. Um, this is the fisherman stamp. It's all done, it's one seam. I also have one where I cut them all apart and I use pieces, but uh, if you ever feel brave about your stamp, go ahead. If you want help doing that, give me a shout. And then we have a happy Father's Day stamp and some gemstones. I'm just gonna pull them up. These are from the Peacock, Amazon Adventure and uh, Eye of the Tiger collection from the Boko Bits with Gwen LaFleur. And those are the things I use to make a card become a little bit more masculine, but still have that pretty bling that I like. Um, so I'm going to take my card. I've got it prepped ready to the side and I'm going to do some very simple watercolor. So I'll take my blue. I put it down on my mat. Just trying to make sure that my mat stays in the screen for you. Um, I'm going to take my Distress Oxide and I'm going to put it on the mat and I'm going to spritz some water and I'm going to grab my blending tool. I'm going to put this straight into the ink pad and I'm just going to go around and catch the edges. As I said, always the edges. We're fine. We're fine. <clears throat> and if you are a person who's terrified to do this, uh, know that there's one simple thing I say. Stop and look at it tomorrow because the thing about blending and ink is that it you put it on and it will set up um, overnight so we did one big big heavy class and people were crying about their project uh, they didn't like what they had done they caused a bit of too much problem and they were really unsatisfied and I said just wait and then tomorrow when we finish the assemblies uh, bring it back and see what you think well every single woman who was upset with their project came back the next day and was blown away by what, how these would blend together and fade. And so don't stress. If you make a mistake, just put it to the side and just wait. It's um, blending is one of those things that ink just cures overnight and you'll get a, a finished polished look without the eyes or whatever you caught that you didn't really actually want to get. And uh, it's pretty simple. Pretty easy so no more wasting no more panicking um, no just just love your love your projects not saying that I do them all the time and love them there are many times I throw things out I'm gonna get this ready okay so what I did there just in case you were wondering is I wanted to create a two-tone color because I've got two-tone color on my card so it'll create a nice frame and then I take my water Oh, wrong brush first. So I've got this one really fine brush. This is a Dynasty, what does it say if I can read it? Black Silver 510. Maybe, let me just make sure that's the right one. Uh, yeah, that was the right one. Okay, so 510. Um, super fine. And the reason I like it is because I'll grab the water, uh, put it into the blue, and then it's really harsh so when I go to color over the ripples it gives a much more contrast than just a typical water coloring would do and you can do this with your Copic markers you can color it in any way you want I just find this is my really quick cheaty way to color um, and it, again and when you're finished with the water color and, and these distress inks in particular they will blend and cure and look really good tomorrow um, if you don't like what you saw today. And it's really not the end of the world. 
Um, I, I don't know if anyone's making comments. Is there any comment or question while I'm doing this? We'll go with no. Perfect. <laughs> um, okay, just clean my brush out. I'm gonna take a little bit of the brown before I start mixing. And I'm just gonna add, oh, first I need to do it with this one. If you notice, I don't clean anything. Um, I just go. Uh, I just wanna get his vest in nice and light, kind of that khaki-ish color. And then I want to add a bit more solid into his pant because then I'm going to tie his pant and vest into his shirt. And on a stamp like this, it's great because it's already there laid out for you. So you can just follow the lines. You don't have to create your new color. Um, you don't have to create your line, your definitions. I'm just going to fill it in a little. Okay, and switch. Oh, yeah, before I do that, I also forgot, let me go back to this. I wanna add as much water, blue water in, before I start adding the brown to it, or <laughs> else I'll start crying, because then I'll have screwed it all up. Uh, at the end of this, I also have a sneak preview of some stuff we just, we finally got. A piece so many things have been coming in like we ordered them at creativation we ordered them after creativation shipping's been slow and some things have waited months some things came in in weeks and we just received one of our newest releases uh, that i think is going to shock a lot of people we're very excited to be working with um am butler and we've been doing some watercolors some heat set watercolors they release in Je july um, and today we got, um, her fabric arrived. So Emerald Creek is expanding into fabrics and we're excited for that because they go well with her heat set watercolor. She's a sewer by nature. And so this will tie the two together nicely. So now I'm just going to bring my two colors together and I'm going to start in my grasses and trees because it's easy for me to get the blending happening before I hit his shirt with it because I can add more blue pigment as I go Let's see. there we go so now I've got like a steel gray khaki gray color coming on into his shirt it's quite simple quite a simple way to get your whole project done in seconds really um Audrey are you there yes I'm I thinking am she's not yes I am I can't see Facebook so from my screen. And I'm just wondering if anyone has a question. Yes, I'm right here. And yes, I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, okay. One was, where do you get the tape gun from? That you showed at the um, beginning. Mostly online. You can find them sometimes on Amazon. Uh, there's one called N NHS, I think it is, in Toronto. Uh, they're an online store and they sell them. Framing galleries tend to sell these guns um, or framing supply places. It's very popular there. Perfect. They also commented that they love to see how you fixed your oopsie. That's so neat that uh, <laughs> to see how artists can do that. You know, we all make mistakes, but they're always creative mistakes, how we fix them. So uh, another question was, do you sell the paper? Or where do you get it from? Uh, which, like, do I sell the digital printing paper? We, yeah, I think that's sell, what it was. We sell one called um, Lux. It's our printer paper because it's a heavier weight than a typical print, uh, typical paper. Uh, I believe this sits at about 40 pounds. Uh, print paper is about 20. So it'll actually still feed through and not jam in your printer, which is why we love it. And so it prints really nicely. You can do this on printer paper, not a big deal. Creative Scrapbooker, um, you can buy their card stock direct from them. And all of these digitals are online and they range from, I think, all the digital prints are 50 cents to $2, depending on what it is. 
Um, so you just go online, download them. Um, oh, that reminds me. We, I don't know if Audrey got to tell everybody, but we are giving away a $50 gift certificate for the people uh, to a lucky winner from commenting today. I don't know how she's doing it. Um, so yeah, you might want to. Basically, if we, we mentioned it in the, uh, the comments, and if they comment, their name will go in a draw, and we will uh, message them uh, during the show. So people have been notified already, and we will put a Ooh. list up after the show. So. That's yeah. awesome. Also, that. somebody's asking, what are your what are you rubbing your brush and stamps on? Is that a brown paper bag or what is that that's oh you're using as your palette? I have it's a craft sheet. Um I have a variety of them. These ones, this one was a baking one actually. Uh, I use it at, for making the rubber in the press. But Ranger sells one. Um Ken Oliver sounds a, sells a really great one. I bought a huge one from him that's on my stamp making table because it always cleans up nicely. But yeah, it's any kind of silicone Teflon type mat that you can get. Um, Teflon, I would say, more than silicone. It's not super sticky. Perfect. Um, and I think now with the popularity of these things, you can get cheap brands at the dollar store. The only thing I'm going to say is I've used so many different brands because I bake them with rubber and stuff. Um, and the dollar store one, be prepared to keep replacing them because they will tear and snag as you heat on it and wipe it and do all that. They're just a little bit thinner and not quite as durable, but for the price point, you can afford to replace it. So go for it. Um, now, can you put your design right up to the camera? Some of the people wanted to see a little bit of a closer up of the, the design here. Oh, and a lot of them commented that uh, it's not easy to find Father's Day designs and the stamps. So where do you get the stamps? The stamps are on my site at emeraldcreek.co. Um, in Canada, there's actually quite a few. I did the same thing I did last time I was making this. Um, there's quite a few stores across Canada that carry stuff. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that Paper Pastimes here in um, Calgary has this particular collection. I'm trying to think. There, I think there's one in Ontario that may have them as well. Um, but yeah, so now I've just stamped on in the blue. Oh. The Happy Father's Day. Yes. Very nice. So super simple. And now all I'm going to do is tape it to the card and then add my stones. And the reason I tape it down first is because trying to glue down once the stones are on, it's all humpy bumpy. And I'm going to do it my way and then I'll flip it around for you to watch while I stick the stones on. Okay. So for me, I, I tend to take my stones and just place a few around and see what I like, where I like them. Maybe a really nice sized one. I want to grab a couple. Oh yeah, I like that. So once I've kind of figured out what I like where, then I will start by just putting glue. And I actually like using uh, Tombow and Beacon glue, but I couldn't find mine because we've done a million keg crafts. I'm sure they're in the house. Um, Come on, hand. Sorry. I've got an arm injury and I can't actually squeeze the trigger on my glue gun and my left hand will make it look really messy. So I'm going to try and squeeze it out on my mat here. Ow. Come on, glue. I said, uh, I don't even know. Like this, this glue gun in particular is from at least 1992 because that was before I moved to Alberta. And I happen to know that's when mom bought the glue, had all the glue guns up in our old attic. <laughs> so pre-1992 and glue guns are awesome. This is a master craft from Canadian Tire that's that old. Um, ouch, sorry. <clears throat> I'm 
I'm in the midst of physio on my arm because it's, I actually pulled it quite badly. So I don't do a lot right now. <laughs> Great. Yes. Well, I caught the press. That's, that's not helpful over. when you're a crafter. That's for sure. Right. Well, and yeah. it was funny because I, I don't know why I thought I could wonder woman into a scenario where my press was rolling down the, the delivery trucks, the, the movers, they just didn't have it on properly. And I ran up the ramp and I caught the 800 pound press like this. And this was my stronger arm, of course. So it took the brunt of the thing and I wrecked my elbow. Oh. We did not lose the press though. It is working so I can make stamps. Anyway, there you go. That's Completely beautiful. All ready for Father's project. Day. Father's That's Day. I got you. Luckily, very my good, Kim. Cut. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I thought I would do is a quick sneak peek. Where did I put it down? Oh, hold on. I moved. For those who are curious and Butler, <laughs> this is some of the sheets of fabric that came in. We've started with these tone on tone kind of fabrics because with her heat set watercolors, you can do this on fabric. So here's a, First sneak peek. I just got a picture of it this morning, so she doesn't even know that she hasn't gotten to see hers. But anyway, then you can color it all in. It's all imaged. Oh. Wash it. Make your bags from it and do things like that. But this is now for your DIY home decor, sewers. So you can make pillows, bags, whatever. And the other thing we have, and I'm going to give a little snippet now that I, I know how we're going to do it. We finally mastered the manufacturing process uh, because I could not find someone to make paper for me. I learned how to manufacture my own. So we will be coming out with sheets of embossed paper. That one's burnt copper leaves, hammered metal, charred gold, and I have a little sample here of the, no, I don't, I can't find it. Never mind. I dropped it. Uh, we also have fractured ice, which were my four leading popular embossing powders. So we're really excited because for the people who love to craft now, you can die cut them. You don't have to do all the embossing. If you're not into that, you can have the paper without having to do the work. Incredible. Incredible. So, yeah. Well, Kim, Thank you so much. Maybe we can see your face. Move your camera up a oh. minute so we can just say, uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. there we go. I am still here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all your information. And we'll have to have you on Audrey Live in the next month or so so you can update us and show us some samples of all those new products. That's amazing. So For sure. <laughs> and people can anyway, get more everyone... information on your website. We've had your website going by so they can get information there. And uh Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to have you and to share all the information you have for us. Thank you for having us. And I will be in to give my little comments to everyone later tonight once kids are in bed. But so excited to be a part of it. Thank you, Audrey. Congratulations on launching what probably is the first and scariest of all the events. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And hopefully we'll see you in September. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> all I right. Take care, you. Kim. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, we are hoping to be out in Calgary uh, area in September for our show out there. It's still a go. So everybody keep your fingers crossed. Uh, our next guest uh, is someone that I've had the pleasure of knowing as a friend for many years. She is enthusiastic and works very hard and certainly has been a great help for many of the projects that I've been working on. Debbie James. Debbie is from Port Elgin, Ontario. She has been painting for approximately 30 years. She has dabbled in most mediums, but enjoys working mainly in acrylics and mixed medias. Debbie has been involved in several organizations over the years, including Society of Decorative Painters, the Hamilton Ecr uh, Area Decorative Artists, the Harborside Painters, and the Shoreline Artists Association uh, up in Port Elgin, where she is now. Debbie is a deco art helping artist and a dynasty brush designer. She continues to design and teach local classes, seminars, and at conventions. And Debbie's, Debbie's studio is DJ's Design and Studio. Hi, Debbie. Welcome. Hi, Audrey. How are you? Good, good. Just going <laughs> to move it down a wee bit go. here. Great. 
Great. Um, do you mind if I just drop in and go ahead here? Well, I'll just say, give a little intro. What you're going to be showing us is that said that some some people have difficulty obtaining paint, painting surfaces and supplies, especially in the time of our restrictions right now. So you're going to offer us some alternatives and suggestions of what things we might have an, on hand that we can already use. I have a number of things here that I want to show you. Awesome. Um, we'll I... just let you go at it there, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. And thanks very much for doing this. This has been awesome. I've been on all day watching and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. So congratulations to you to running such a wonderful venue for us all. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm going to uh, begin just by uh, telling you some of the sourcing that I've done over the years um, as far as uh, finding different uh, things to paint with or to add to my paintings or uh, to any of the craft work that I've done. So to begin with, I love to poke around yard sales. I love to go to thrift store. I love to go to um, the ReStore that Habitat for Humanity has. But uh, with being stuck at home, I've had to kind of look around my stash and see what I could come up with. So one of the things that uh, I did was to take an old canvas. I painted over top of it. This is my attempt at uh, abstract art. You can see that there's a couple of beautiful big twigs in there from my yard. Um, sea glass is always popular with people. And this is a little drawing that has uh, a clothesline with sea glass and some pebbles and some sticks and it uh, says wash away wash wash your cares away I love doing glass bottles this one has sea glass from Nova Scotia shells from Cuba and coral from um, Mexico so that was just added in I have a little cutout of uh, flip flops added some raffia this little guy was one of the very first recycled things that I did. This was offered by Heather Hope, one of our painters from Hatta and from Harborside. And it is a light bulb and it's sitting on a metal washer for stability. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I'd like to talk to you too a little bit about acrylic pores. I have done tons of acrylic pours and you always have paint left over from the runoff and so these dry and become acrylic skin so with these skins i've made some bracelets and i try to get this close enough so that you can see it but then i've also done some pendants so these are done on metal trays and um, with a little bit of skin inside and this little guy has triple thick over top. This one has a glass cabochon over top. This little pendant is actually a metal washer. And I just poured over top of it. And these little ones at the end, I did as a, a cash and carry at uh, Coast to Coast one time. And these are actually eggshells that are uh, colored with alcohol links and then triple thick over top. Lots of fun. Another pour that I did was just on a small uh, six by or five by seven canvas. And uh, it looked very plain without anything else on it. So I thought, well, these are sort of the peacock colors. So I added my peacock pendant over top. I just cut off the ring on his head and attached him with some um, really good glue to hold it in, in place. So now it's a little bit different and it's added on or added to its uh, aesthetic value. Talking some more about alcohol links. This is a, a candle holder that came from the dollar store many, many years ago. And it was just clear glass. And I used alcohol ink to add some bronze and copper to it. 
It's very pretty in the light. It's very reflective. When it's all finished, it's going to have copper wire with amber beads on it. And I think it will be very attractive. It has a partner. So there are two of those. Um, well, you can see in the background here, there's an old lamp from Ikea that uh, is all done in alcohol ink. It was for a young lady who had a purple bedroom who no longer lives here. And there are some embellishments on it to um, give it a little bit of sparkle as well. This is a paper mache box that I've had for many years. And it was painted and it looked pretty flat and uninspiring. So I went ahead and added alcohol inks to it as well. And it has some pearl white in it and it's very pretty when you see it in person. I then took a Krylon pen and put a border around the lid just to add a little bit of pizzazz so it's much nicer looking. And, <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to talk to you as well about different metal surfaces. When I was saying about going to yard sales and so on, I was at a sort of a flea market, antique market uh, many, many years ago, and I picked up all these galvanized metal sap buckets. So this is used on the maple trees to gather the maple syrup. And using um, DecoArt's paint adhesion medium, I prepped it first with that, cleaned it well, let it dry thoroughly, added the paint adhesion medium. And this design is out of one of the painting magazines from many years ago, and I can't remember which one, so I apologize for not uh, designating who the designer is. But anyway, it, it's... Uh, something that I use at Christmas in the house and it has big stocks of different um, festive reeds and things. And one thing that I've been doing a lot of lately is painting on uh, glass bottles. So there are many, many different um, products out there that you can use. Uh, Krylon matte finish is one of the ones that I like to use uh, regularly. Krylon also has sea glass um, colored matte, uh, colored acrylic spray. So you can have pink or green or blue, and uh, they're available here at our heart, local hardware store in the spray paint section. And they're very good for painting on. So the glass just needs to be cleaned thoroughly and then sprayed with the um, acrylic spray. And then you can go ahead and you can use your regular acrylic paints. So I use Americanas uh, almost exclusively. So I would just go ahead and paint over top, uh, paint the design over top with my acrylic paint. And then I have some little lanterns and things that I've bought. This has a little electric, or sorry, battery operated candle inside. And so that will be one of the things that will be going to the craft sale with me if we are able to have our craft sales. Um, if you see my stash, it looks like I drink a lot of uh, liquor and wine, but I assure you that I've been having many, many friends save bottles for me. So this is just another example. It has a string of LED lights in it and uh, very pretty when it's all lit up. Makes a great centerpiece. And I have lots for Christmas and lots for uh, uh, a lot of beachy scenes because in the summer we usually have a couple of very large craft sales here. And this is what the bottle looks like when it's sprayed with the Krylon spray and it's ready to paint on. Um, one of the things that I have used also is uh, Decoart frost glass enamels. And these are uh, the transparent ones that I've used. This was um, brought to my attention by Renee Mullins. And then also Wendy Faye uses uh, this as well for painting on glass. And it's really effective. I mean, a couple of things that I wanted to mention were embellishments that you can add to your um, paintings 
your craft work. Diamond dust is one of the ones that I use. This is actually a crushed glass. You can add it in for sparkle for snow or for waves. This is one that I uh, picked up at Walmart, I believe. It's for color for products. And this is an iridescent um, flake. And I don't know whether you can see the color or not, but it's just beautiful. So this can actually be added to your acrylic pores. Excuse my back. There's a couple of products that I really like. And um, I don't think people are widely aware of them. They're produced by TriArt, which is a Canadian company. They're based in Kingston, Ontario. And they have a whole line of product which is available at Desserts or at Curry's. Uh, but one of the things that I really liked about their products was that they have um, several that use recycled product in it. So this is an acrylic, um, acrylic gel medium that has uh, reharvested plastic in it and I'll show you what it looks like on the uh, on the canvas in a minute and this is reharvested uh, glass so it looks sort of speckly in here these both look very milky in the jars but they dry clear and so they're very pretty this is uh, just a quick and dirty painting that I did uh, just in the last couple of last couple of days. And you can see that there's a lot of sparkle in here. And this is the one with the um, recycled plastic. So it's given this wave foam sort of a bit of texture and a bit of sparkle and added a lot to it. It was very flat looking otherwise. This is a work in progress. It's actually a slate roofing shingle from an old farmhouse. And I put a little bit of this um, reharvested glass in along here to look as if it was, um, excuse me, I'm gonna move this a little bit, to make it look as if it was sea glass along the shore. So this will have uh, little bits of driftwood on it and it will have um, some shells and some twigs and so on to look like driftwood but then it also has this little bit of glass which adds texture and a little sparkle and these slate shingles are very heavy um, if any of you have used um, gold leafing in the past. Here's a product that uh, is kind of interesting. You use your um, gold leafing adhesive exactly the same way as you normally would, but this is a jar of gold uh, leafing flakes. So there's a variety of different colors that you can get. And this is from um, Cosmic Shimmer Gilding Flakes. This one is called Warm Sunrise. So I haven't used it yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. When I was speaking about the recycled glass, here's a little jar that I uh, just put it on one side and I put a fairly heavy uh, application of it. This was done with a palette knife, but you can also add small amounts with brush. So it's very easy to use. And um, I think enough. that's just about couple, it. A couple of questions for you, Deb, that came up. Sure. Where do you get the bracelets and the blanks for using with your acrylic pore skins for the bracelets and the little blanks for the necklaces? Where do you find those? Uh, the, the little tray, the large tray, I should say, this one came from Michael's and they don't sell the glass cabochon with it. This one with the glass over top, it's a little glass dome that glues right on over top. I ordered off of Amazon and you can buy them bulk and they're not very expensive. Um, the bracelet blanks have actually a little tunnel on the side where your um, acrylic skin can fit in underneath so that you get a nice smooth edge. And they, they I got these online as well and I really can't tell you the name of the company. You just, you would have to search for it. Awesome. But, um, 
Yeah, it was a company in the States, and they have a real variety of different shapes and sizes. They have gold tones, silver tone, that sort of thing. They are um, not cheap um, price-wise, but they're not of great, uh, great quality, put it that way. You would need to seal it inside so that your wrist didn't turn black, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, but these they're pretty. Some some great ideas and i love that metal washer idea too it's such a neat uh, uh thing to use i wouldn't even think of yeah a little bit different yeah fabulous yeah. finds and amazing what you do from your thrift store finds. so thank you so much for being with us and sharing all your uh unique ideas and i know a lot of people uh, have been inspired to go to those thrift stores and and find all those special little treats as well yeah or search around at home see what you have Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, take care Thanks. up there. Yes, a everybody stay up safe. In Fort Algon. Hope you didn't get yes. too, too many of the storms up there. Oh, it was pretty good, but not as bad as you guys. Um, <laughs> anyway, everybody stay safe, stay well, and thanks very much for having me, Audrey. Perfect. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Deb. That was awesome, inspiring. I think a couple of people mentioned that they're going to have to start saving their wine bottles now, that they have lots of ideas for those. So uh, our next guest is Mika Akita, and she is based in Toronto, Ontario. Mika is an avid crafter, including cartonage, book binding, and pocket scrapbooking. She is working as an owner of a craft online store and teaches workshops and hands-on crafts everywhere. Welcome, Mika, to the show. Hello. You can hear me? <laughs> yes. Yes, we yes, can hear okay. you. I think you're good. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think we're just going to get started because we're running just a bit behind. So we're going to go straight yeah. to your, uh, what are you going to be doing for us today? Uh, so we will make it a best in the mini album collection box. <laughs> I think so, it's just start? adorable. Just yeah. adorable. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. You can start your uh, presentation yeah. there and we'll chat uh, later. Okay. All right, so uh, let's start. Um, maybe not let us pick up your, Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, first part, you know, I'm gonna like explain you know, like this mini album. Um, first, prepare the paper. So, please, you know, cut you know like the paper uh, in the size. Uh, I'm using you know, like scrapbooking paper but you can use any, any paper you want. Uh, so three papers uh, you need, you know, like uh, for making in you know, one book. Uh, so after that, you know, three paper together, fold at half and three holes we need on this position. So now I'm gonna change the camera. Now it's just sewing. So I put, Big number, but you don't you know, like, uh, have to use a big number, <laughs> but you easy to understand probably. So numbers um, starting from inside, number two at the center. Just in the afternoon, like a few, you know, like a slide here, and you're going to number one, like this. Pass number two, going to number three, like this, and back to number two. So at that time, if you do say, you know, like a sum in a slide in a pool, it's okay. However, please do not pull that opposite way. It means in you know, a tear the paper. So be very careful that part. And also that, you know, like uh, there is another you know, like horizontal thread at the center. So, you know, uh, kind of sandwiches in the first thread and last thread, slide, you know, like together and then tie. And after that, you can add and glue if you want. And finally, cut quarter inch to cut here. Finally, this in the mini envelope is done. So now, going to the box. Prepare. Prepare the chipboard. Please cut the chipboard in this size. And after that, this one is an outside paper. I'm using scrapbooking paper. You can use in any paper you want. Uh, so um, at the center, 
you need this size box uh, to draw. This is the spine location. And this part to cut the some angle towered to the corner of the box you draw right now. And now to build in a chipboard. First, chipboard A and B. This is important. Uh, to apply the bond edge of chipboard A, like this. And chipboard B together like this. I'm using you know like a small weight like this. You can use book, jar, anything you want. And just you know standing you know like it's chipboard B for a few seconds. Exactly same way, opposite side. This U shape is coming like this. Now add the chipboard C. Add the, chi add the bond on this U shape, like this. And the chipboard C attached to top and the bottom. So chipboard C like this. Exactly the same in this side. You will be done, chipboard box. Now outside paper. So apply the bond spine of the box, like this. And you draw the, you know, like a, a box in a, at the center, just put over there. Just put gently, push and gently upside down from this side too. Now, another important thing, if you paper attached to the inner box before using a bond, Fold the paper first. Now apply the bond like this. And attach to the paper like this. So this time, both side and paper amount equals better. And by scissors to cut corner of the box like this, and this side like this. Now, this part is attached to the box, always holding the paper. Now, this time you're gonna get the bond onto the paper like this, attached to the you know, box like this. Exactly same this side. Done like that. So now work with this part. Always holding the paper. Now pick up scissors. Scissors inside the box. Cut both sides. So there is a chipboard here, right? So there is no cut the paper at the end. And add the bond in at the center. And fold into the box like this. Like this. And here, just add the bond like this. Attach to the box. Still, this paper is in stick out in the front of the box. So just cut. Like this. Exactly the same way to do this side. Done like that, right? So now front cover and back cover. Always for the paper. And apply the bond on here. A little bit careful because in this part is in the surface is in a little bit bigger, right? Bond has a lot of water. So it means you know if you use a lot of bond absorbing the absorbing the water into the chipboard, 
sometimes in the box shape will be changed. So a little bit careful to control the amount of the uh, bond, please. And after that, gently attach to the box. If you have flat thin one like tools, you can use that. Bone holder, that's fine. After that, working with this, always fold the paper. And inside of uh, scissors, inside of box, cut this time the corner. Just 45 in, uh, angles to cut toward to the box, a uh, box and corner of the box. Just gonna cut like this. And at the bond. Like this exactly same top and bottom fold into the box. And now, still you know, like on the paper stick out sometimes, just cut by the scissors gently, please, this time. Or very fine paper file using gently, please. <laughs> And also, sometimes in the corner of the box is very sharp, just tapping like this. Exactly, same way to do this side. Yes, box is down like this. This year on like a uh, collection box is in a three mini album is fit. And after, finally, I attach you know, like a stay home 2020. You can use in any title you want. And, but you know, I can share some ideas. Happy home dates, and summer vacation, newborn babies, and last one is, this is my dog. Uh, you can use in a photo instead of just title. And also, you know, this is very small, so um, you can use, you know, um, any, um, some, you know, gift, you know, like uh, for holidays, uh, birthday, something like this, especially a uh, friend or, you know, like a family is living far away from you. It's uh, easy to send because it's uh, small, right? <laughs> and also this is great, you know, like for the kids because, you know, like a big album is very good, but, you know, like uh, sometimes it's very difficult to open by the small kids. It's a small, no problem. So the kids open this in a mini album. Family member, parents, you know, tell about, you know, like a, any photo, you know, like a stories, you know, of this, you know, like a mini album collection. This is great, you know, like a maybe conversation piece in the family, I think. So last things, uh, Stay Home 2020 inside. I am going to share and then on like a Facebook you know, page in you know, probably. So if you're interested in, you know, like please check that. Also, uh, if you have any questions, please send me an email or you know, like a face Facebook page, you know, like a message to send okay. hands on craft anywhere. <laughs> we had a couple of questions, Mika. One was a couple of them were asking, what is the bond that you're using, the adhesive? What is that that you're using? Yeah, actually this is, you know, like a book binding bond, but then this is a very small, right? <laughs> so any white bond, I'm using in a white bond like this, right? So any Perfect. bond is okay, I think. So no problem. Good, good. And also at the beginning using thread, what kind of thread do you use? Oh, good question. Uh, well, if we're not like this kind of in a book binding slot, you can usually book binder using a um, linen thread, but this is small book. <laughs> so anything <laughs> is okay. Uh, embroidery, you know, like a thread or, you know, some, you know, like a sewing machine thread, no problem, I think. And do you have the instructions or a kit or something available that they can contact you if they want more details oh, on it? Sure, if you're interested, I is that interested in, you know, like uh, exactly the same material I have, not sure, <laughs> but you know, like if I have, you know, I can send, um, I can 
think about that thing. Yeah, yeah. Or like an no instructions problem. or something like that that they can go by for it. So. Yeah, good, good. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. That was amazing. I just love the little mini mini book. And a lot of them mentioned that it would be a really neat idea to do with their children or grandchildren as a memory <laughs> from this time. So uh, thank you. Thank we appreciate you. you being with us. Thank you, Audrey. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you, everybody. <laughs> that was incredible. I think everybody really enjoyed that cute little box. Amika is just a, a wonderful uh, caring person. I know we've had her quite a few times teaching for us and uh, just great to have her. So uh, our next presenter is uh, Jill Fitzhendry, aka Jilly Bean. A lot of you know her by Jilly Bean. She lives in Savage, Minnesota, and she is a Dynasty brand specialist and a teacher coordinator. She is also a deco art helping artist, travel teacher, and a past president of the Society of Decorative Painters. For the past 40 years, she has produced hundreds of designs available as pattern packs, books, and videos. If you don't like floating color to create sanding and highlighting, it is in her books. You are not going to want to miss the demonstration that she's gonna give us of an alternative way to blend your colors with your paintings. Are we there, Jill? Can you hear me? Let's see. If I, there I am. Ah, okay. yeah. Awesome. Good to see you. <laughs> and one thing I always comment on you is you're just always so fresh and colorful and just looking at you makes me happy. Well, it's showtime. <laughs> so maybe not so fresh on it when no one's looking at the camera, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, thank so. you for being with us today. We really appreciate it. And you're going to uh, do a wonderful demonstration for us. So I'll just, we're running a bit behind, so we're just going to let you go right to it. Awesome. Sounds great. Okay. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we should be in London, Ontario right now for the convention. And oh gosh, we had a blast last year. I can't say enough good things about it. So I am actually going to show you how I use my double-ended brush. I have a brush that's made for me by Dynasty. And it's called the Jelly Bean Dirty Dancer. Uh, one end has a blender. The other has a pointed round. And then I'm going to be using the DecoArt extender blending medium and instead of water in the brush and that's how I get all my blending done on my pieces. So I'm going to see if I can get into, let's see, I want to try and get into my other camera here. I know that there's, I was in it before, hang on. Let's see. Well, okay. Share screen record. There's video. Let's see if it's, oops. There we go. Okay, here we are. All right. So what I have is, um, a cutting board and I've painted a uh, tulip and uh, daffodil on it, but I'm gonna show you on the tulip how I do the blending. So I'm gonna zoom in and this is a, a new pattern packet that I have. I'm gonna zoom in here just a little closer so you'll be able to see exactly what I'm doing here. All right, so um, to start with, I base coated the tulip with um, a combination of wild berry, the DecoArt Americana, half wild berry and half titanium white. Normally I love using the uh, Traditions um, and they now come in a tube, um, but I'm using up some of my old bottles. So I mix the, the pink and the white and any kind of pink that's your favorite pink is going to work out just fine. I've put some extender blending medium uh, from the traditions into a little cup and then I'm going to use my double ended brush here and I'm going to dip both ends into the extender and blend and blot them off on my paper towel. Okay. Now Depending on the surface and the design and how big of a piece I'm working on, sometimes I pre-moisten the whole thing. Sometimes I just add the extender into my paint color itself. Uh, but for this one, I'm going to go ahead and moisten. Now, even though 
I wiped this off on a paper towel. There is still plenty of extender in that blender side of the brush. So I'm just going to kind of rub that in, get a little more, blot it off, blend that into my tool up here. If you get too much, you want to take a paper towel and blot it so that it's, uh, you don't, you want it to actually be in the surface, not just sitting on top. So if you're not sure, set a paper towel down, blot it gently, and remove the towel. Okay, I'm going to um, start by putting some uh, highlights in. So I've got the extender in my round brush side. And I'm going to, um, I've, I've actually mixed some of the um, wild berry using colors from traditions and I get a, a color that's very close. So what I mixed was equal parts of naphthol red, quinacridon violet, and titanium white. And I come up with that pretty much that same color as the wild berry. Okay, now I want to make a paler color than what I had for base coating. So I'm just gonna, and I usually just brush mix. Get a little more white in there, I think. So I just didn't wanna start with a bright white for my highlight. I'll do that for the, the other one. Okay, now when I'm putting this on, I'm gonna go ahead and use a generous amount um, I'm using that long pointed round. I'm going to lay it in. I can make it thicker in the areas I want it to be thicker. Okay, then I'm going to turn my brush around and I'm going to gently use the blender side to almost just erase or blend that inside edge. Now, if you're used to floating color, um, you know, with a corner load on a flat or an angle, absolutely, you could still do that. But one of the things that this is um, nice for is if you want to get a center highlight somewhere. So let's say I'm going to put some here and I'm going to come down that center vein. I can lay this in nice and solid and then flip the brush over and just gently blend that color away. So I get a nice bold amount of color to begin with. And I don't have to um, go back and put layer after layer after layer. I'm gonna leave a little space in between, get some across the top, flip the brush over, and the reason I've got uh, the double-ended brush is because before I was constantly putting the other brush in my mouth. Now you certainly could use um, a dry brush blender and some rounds for doing this technique, but I constantly put the other brush in my mouth and then hurried up and did the blending. So I just think it was easier to just go ahead and flip the brush over it's much faster to do it that way. But see, I can get a nice bold color on here. Okay, so now this is one where I want the highlight more in the middle. So see, I can just color book that in. Nice solid amount. Flip the brush over and just gently soften that edge. As I get too much uh, paint on that blender brush, I'm going to come back on my paper towel and kind of rub it in a circle to get the excess paint off of it. And then I'll go back, get the other side, just a soft, soft touch. I'm barely touching the paint. And I'm trying not to go into the very center of the area where the paint is. I want to try and do mainly the edges. If I blend away too much, I just go back and add a little bit more on. I want to get some more actually on this first petal. So a little bit more solid, just a soft, soft touch. Okay, another nice thing about this, um, using the extender like this, is if I were to outline an edge, if 
I just left it outlined like this. It would, I mean, it just looks like it's outlined. But because I've got the extender, I can just barely catch that inside edge and it softens it and it doesn't look like you've actually outlined the edge. So it gives it a nice crisp edge to it. We'll get some on the center one back here. So basically, I'm just kind of choosing, you know, a medium color to base coat my flower in, lighter color for highlighting, darker color after for the shading. And I'll do the outline on this other petal. I really load my brush and I'm not rinsing it in water in between unless I go to switch colors because if it gets dry on my brush, I'll add a dab of extender into the paint to loosen the paint on the brush a little bit. Okay, and I think I'll get a little bit more here. I want this to pop forward just a little more. Flip the brush over, just gently soften, catch that edge where you want to blend. Put a little more on this side as well. Really pop that forward. Flip the brush over and gently blend. Okay, now, now I am going to be switching color. So now I do want to rinse my brush in water and rinse it off. I do want to also make sure that I get all the extra off my blender brush. But because I rinsed it in water, now I want to redip it in extender, blot it back on the paper towel. And now I'm going to go to the, um, the shade color, which is just going to be the wild berry all by itself. So I'll completely fill the brush with the wild berry. Okay, then I'm going to go into my back petals here first and there again I can lay the color in nice and solid so I'm going to be able to get the depth that I want. Flip the brush over and just gently catch that edge and soften it. I'm not going all the way into the very dark depth of it I, because I don't want to be removing that color. Get some on the other back petal there again. You just lay it in exactly where you want it. And I do use the extender blending medium with both Traditions or Americana. Um, Love using this technique when I'm doing my Santa faces. And for that, because they already have, you know, flesh colors pre-mixed, I go ahead and use the Americana. So you can use it with either one. So there's really no secret to the, to the color. And just really soften, lay that in, soften. If I wanted to um, use um, an angle brush to do some of my deeper shadow areas, I can, but I would load that with the extender blending medium first instead of water. So you could do that for this as well. So there again, I laid in a nice solid line and just very gently catch that edge. And that really pops it out away. And I'm going to get the other side. I'm going to put a little bit down the center here, too. And make sure my brush is clean there. Gently just stroke straight down because I don't want to pull the color out into the highlight. All I want to do is get rid of that really harsh edge and get that depth. And this is how I do all of the leaves and the petals. So you can see that it's um, actually pretty quick to do once you get comfortable doing this. Everyone lives in a different 
type of climate. So you're going to have to adjust the amount of extender that you do use um, on your pieces. Uh, some areas they dry really fast, so I have to use a little bit more. Others uh, might be so humid that I've got to use a little less. I, I use a little bit more extender if I'm working on a canvas, a little less if I'm working on a wood piece. Put some on the back edge here and soften. Now if I were to make a mistake or if it's not blending, I can sometimes re, um, uh, re uh, not reconstitute, but I can sometimes uh, get it to reactivate. So I put a little extender on the blender brush. It was starting to dry on me there. So it kind of reactivates the paint, loosens it up so that I'm able to blend it a little bit more. So because my brush is getting a little dry, I'm putting a little drop of extender into my color now. Um, I'm going to get a little bit, create a little crease here. And just carefully pull that, soften that. Once I put the extender down on the piece, I don't want to go back and add any more on the surface. I only do it in the very beginning. And then after that, if I need extra moisture for blending, it goes into the paint color itself. I'm going to create a little indent here in the middle. So pull a line and just gently soften. I don't know, I just find that it's, for me, on some of these areas, it's just easier using this technique than trying to flip-flop your angle or um, flat brush back and forth to try to get some of the shadow areas in there. Now, if you wanted to, you could uh, blow dry areas in between if you're starting to um, run in or, or smudge some of the other colors, but otherwise I just keep going. I It almost reminds me of working um, like you're working with an oil. Um, two more things, I, I can just pop up some of those highlights one more time. So I rinsed my brush in water and then um, Re-put it in extender, blot it on the towel. I'm going to get some titanium white. And I, I don't just take a little dab. I actually pat that all the way into the bristles so that it's fully loaded. It, there's not a big glob on the outside, but it is fully loaded. And then I'm going to just pick a few areas um, to add some stronger highlights. Now, because this is a center area here, if I was using a uh, angle brush, I'd be having to flip flop it back and forth. Here, I can lay it right in the middle and then soften. This is great too when you're doing the center highlight in a cheek area because you're able to just lay it in solid and then soften the edges. And just a gentle touch. I'm barely, it's almost like I'm up in the air uh, when I'm painting these areas in. I'm kind of going in the center areas with this final highlight instead of on an edge. But I can certainly go back and I can clean up edges if I need to. And if you needed to switch to a liner brush for smaller areas, you sure could. But this brush has a pretty nice point on it so you're able to do a lot of it with just the one brush. Now I've been using um, the large Jelly Bean Dirty Dancer. It comes in two sizes. There's a small also. Uh, the small I would probably use on um, the smaller like the violets that are on this piece. Uh, let's see where else do I want this? Maybe a little bit on that ridge coming down just to soften it and just barely pull, don't, don't push too hard. Barely drag that little edge, maybe a little bit here just to pull this petal away from the other one. 
and just catch that inside edge a little bit. And in between, make sure that you're cleaning your brush, uh, blender brush off on the paper towel. Um, and a lot of times I like to get the whole piece done and then take another look to see if I need more shadow, more highlights before I call it done. I like to see all the areas. Rinse my brush one more time. Um, and I'm going to deepen, get the extender. I'm going to deepen just those back petals a little bit more here. Put some just in the very bottom of those back petals. And I'm using the Naphthol Red Light. Still keeping it a nice bright color, but it's a deeper, deeper red or pink. And you just have to make it your own. Now, if I if I were to add, um, you know, a, 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 a lot of people tend to add a little bit more of a, a brown color into those areas and then that just makes it look a little bit dirtier. So I want to use a bright color that has some depth to it, some to get that to really pop. But you can see that once you get the hang of this, this is actually a very quick way to go ahead and blend. Okay, and I do the same if I was going to be tinting it. I do this for the leaves and all of the other, um, I'm going to zoom out here a little bit, all of the other areas as well. So let's take a look at the actual finished piece here. You can see I've done that, the same technique for all these pieces. Now in the um, pattern packet, you do get um, all the step-by-steps. Let's see if I can switch back to me again. Okay, here I am. All right, so in the pattern packet, which is available on my website, jillybean.net, um, you are getting uh, all the step-by-steps for how to do this flower. So it really is, makes it easy for you. Um, I just want to share another fun little one, that another cutting board that I did, and it's the little gnome, it's oh. little chop chop. Oh, and, he's so uh, cute. Really fun to do. Oh, so uh, yeah. that's available now as well. But the brushes are available on my website. I carry a big supply of the Dynasty brushes, the Black Gold, Faux Squirrel, Faux Sable. So you can get um, lots of them on my, on my uh, site. I've got a lot of free little videos that are on my YouTube channel and they're all linked into my website so that you're able to find them easier. So you can go and watch all kinds of different little techniques. Perfect, perfect. A couple of questions. Somebody asked, where can you get the brush in Canada or Europe? Or is it just through your website or are there other it's avenues? It's through my website up? and I ship all over the world. Well, there you go. Perfect. Oh, so, yep. It's awesome. Yep. And how do you store your double-ended brush? There's a couple things that you can do. First of all, um, if you take hair conditioner that you use in your own hair and you coat this the, the um, brushes, it stiffens them. You know, when you first get brand new brushes, they have a stiffener in them and that helps protect them for shipping. Well, you can do the same thing. Let that dry in there. And if you're, if I'm going to store this in my um, uh, brush container, I'm going to put the blender side down because that's stronger than the one with the fine tip. Ah. However, take a straw, take a little straw, cut it, wrap it around and put it down Perfect. So that's that's what? another easy way to a do it. Great oh. tip. Yeah. Great yeah. tip. And do right. they come in different sizes? Two sizes. I've got a large and a small, and I've been able to do everything with just those two sizes. So Awesome. Yeah. That was just amazing. I think you have definitely inspired so many people that oh, do okay. not like okay. to float to yes. yes. Get that brush. I think you're going to have a lot of orders for that brush, Jill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I find when I teach with it, um, this technique, I'm not having to correct as many people's pieces, you yeah. know, because they're able to play in it longer. 
Perfect. So it really Perfect. has, you know, been a, a fun technique. Well, it's perfect. Well, thank yeah. you so much for being with us. This has been just a treat. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. And um, you. I just, I appreciate you doing this so much for all of the artists and uh, you're doing a great job and, and thank you for including me. Oh, well, thank you, Jill, for being with us and I'm sure we'll do it again. So till next awesome. time. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sounds good. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> She's such a sweetie and we just love her color scheme there. The pinks just make everybody happy. So um, our last presenter and uh, is uh, just an amazing, talented group of artists that we've had on the show today. And so many of them, as you, uh, as I mentioned, are deco art artists. So we know deco art and they have supported us uh, and so many of our artists and businesses and students over the year because quite a few of them uh, use the deco art paints in their classes and uh, it's just amazing to have um, deco art support throughout many years at the our shows and for our artists uh, and I think we're just getting set up here how's it going hello hello and oh there we are <laughs> not the right person there we go <laughs> ah. <laughs> hello we have jennifer jennifer is here and she is the creative design and educated uh, education manager at deco art she has worked in the craft industry as a designer teacher and trend specialist for over 20 years originally from california she has a P ba in fine arts and started her career in the craft industry as a designer at i love to create she loves painting, sculpting, and jewelry, making as some of her favorite forms of creative expression. Uh, she currently manages a talented team of designers at the Deco Art, which is based in Kentucky. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, thank you for having me. It's been a privilege, it's just a privilege to have you here with us today and all the wonderful Deco Art products that you are going to show us. We just can't wait. Yeah, and a shout out to Jilly Bean. Good job on using Americana and Deco Art. So that was great. That was awesome. Great intro to what I'm doing. Perfect. So, great. Yeah, so I'm going to get started today. I'm Jennifer Blevins. As, as she just introduced me, I'm the Creative Design and Education Manager at Deco Art. Um, at Deco Art, really, we pride ourselves in being the most innovative craft paint company in the world. And we've been doing it for 35 years. Um, we have a full range of new and exciting products um, for paint, for crafters, makers, DIYers, and artists. And this is our new 2020 catalog. We put one out every year. Um, this one features hundreds of really just delicious paint products, um, things to just be keep you going and keep you stimulated and excited. So you can find this online too. So today I'm gonna to share with you two of the products that I am most excited about for 2020. The first one is our line of Enchanted and Enchanted Shimmers. They're available at Hobby Lobby and at Michael's. And the second one is Holographic Illusions. And you're gonna see some of those over here. And those are available at Hobby Lobby, Michaels and Joann's, and they're going to be available on our online store soon. So look for them there. So let's get started with Enchanted and Enchanted Shimmer. Let me tell you a little bit about them. We were inspired by the iridescent trends that are at retail. We were seeing them everywhere. And you see them in nature, in butterfly wings, um, peacock feathers, uh, even those scarab beetles, they're just beautiful. And iridescence is really when something gradually changes color, um, depending on the angle of the light. So we developed American Enchanted and Enchan Enchanted Shimmers to capture the beauty of this light shifting color. So let me show you how it works. Okay, first of all, I put together a board with various base coats because the Enchanted and Enchanted Shimmers are a top coat. And um, I wanted you to see when I brush them out that they look very different depending on the base coat that you start with. Um, for example, we even put, we even developed this Enchanted Ultra Black base coat made especially for this line because it gives you such a dramatic and beautiful, darker, um, an intense impact of the iridescent when um, it's on a dark, base coat. On a lighter base coat, it's a little more subtle. And it does look white. It looks white in the bottle, but as soon as you brush it out, as you'll see, you're going to see this beautiful color. 
um, when you're actually painting on a surface that's rounded or one of these surfaces like this, you're probably going to want to do vertical brush strokes and then horizontal brush strokes. But for today, I'm just going to go ahead and do a brush stroke straight across so you can see what, I, what the paint looks like. So we're going to start out with the Enchanted Shimmer, or excuse me, Enchanted Magenta. So this is the iridescent, and we're going across, you're going to see. And as it dries, you'll see what it looks like. And I'll, I'll go ahead and show you in the light what it looks like. I'm going to dry my brush in between so I don't mix them up. The next one is green. And again, it goes on a little bit white because that's the base coat, but it dries really gorgeous. Next one's gold. And I don't know, let's see, I'll show you what I, you can start kind of seeing the difference, I think, a little bit. I'm going to move on to the shimmers. The shimmers are also part of the Enchanted line. And what's beautiful about the shimmers is they have a very, um, almost like a glitter dust in them. So you get a very subtle, beautiful shimmer. So I'm going to do the same kind of magenta, except this is the magenta shimmer. And again, it's a white base. So you're going to see white at first. But you will see the transformation as it dries. And it's so beautiful. Moving on to green, the green shimmer. And then lastly, I'm gonna do a gold shimmer. And as these dry, I'll keep referring back to them and you can see just how amazing they look. And again, as a top coat, you can really take anything that you've already painted um, and take it to the next level in beauty when you see, and I'm gonna hold this up. And I don't know if you can see how it's starting to turn. Okay. So I hope you can see that and I'll show it to you at the, at the end as well so you can see when it's fully dry. Okay. So we're gonna set that aside and we're gonna move on to glitter. I don't know if everyone loves glitter, but at Deco Art, we do, we love glitter. And we are very serious about our glitter. Glitter for us is like potato chips. You cannot stop at one. We are glitter people. And what we love about our glitter is that we have different variations of glitter so that you have a choice. And our glitters contain in these bottles and some of them have clear base coats and some of them have a little bit of a cloudier base coat but they all dry clear and they're all beautiful. And our newest glitter that we're super excited about is Holographic Illusions. This glitter is uniquely made because it's got full spectrum reflective holographic glitter specs. So what that means is you get a rainbow effect that we don't have in any of our other glitters and it really is unique to the market. So I am gonna do for you on this pink base coat, a glitter comparison. Um, so that you can see the different glitter finishes that we have. Okay, so I'm going to get started. And I'm going to start with Holographic Illusions um, because it does have a white base and I want it to be drying so you can see how beautiful it is. And a tip I have for you when you are painting with glitter, if you're painting on something like my friend here, um, you're going to do probably one coat, two coats, three coats, and let them dry, let it dry in between. And you're going to do kind of a cross hatching. So start going one way, like vertical, let it dry, come back and do horizontal. And that way you get really full coverage. Another thing is let me give you a tip on glitter because a lot of people get upset with glitter. They think that's oh, gonna ruin my brush. And it might if you don't use your brush properly. And what I mean by that is the ferrule of the brush, you wanna fully load your brush, but not down into the ferrule because that's where the glitter will get stuck and it won't come out. Um, a tip when you're using glitter, another tip, is use a fan brush. And again, be mindful of the ferrule, but what's nice because it's flat like this, you get a lot of really nice coverage and it's way easier to clean. 
So that's your tip for the day on glitter. But I'm gonna use a flat brush just to show you. So let's get started. I'm gonna start with Holographic Illusions and this is in Fairy Pink. And again, it's got a bit of a white, I don't know if you can see that. It's gonna start drying and you're gonna see some beautiful holographic flakes come out here. Okay. So the next one, this is our galaxy glitter. And this is in Supernova Berry. And what's neat about the galaxy glitter, it has different chunks of glitter in different sizes and different colors. So it really is, as you can see, it's like you get this cosmos of color. And as you paint and go over it and you just, and layer it, you really get an amazing, amazing finish. You see that? Okay. Next up, I'm gonna show you, this is our Twinkles, Craft Twinkles in sparkling pink. I'm a lefty, so sorry if I'm getting in front here. I'll come back and show you. But you can see as the different finishes of glitter, and kind of get an idea what that looks like. <clears throat> and then we have our Glamour Dust in magenta. And Glamour Dust is a very, very fine glitter okay. as well. I'm going to show you this way. So again, depending on what you want to make, you're seeing the different kinds of glitter. Uh, straight up. Hold straight, straight up. up. Yeah, it's a bit this come better? forward. Yeah, it's just a bit hard to see. Okay. There you go. See it's better something. now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then last is our Enchanted Magenta. I showed you the Enchanted earlier, but we really wanted to show you the comparison. So you can kind of see, and again, it's in a white base. So... You will see it's a very fine glitter. So let me see if you can see you straight go. up better. Yeah, I'm kind of with the angle. There can you, you see if I hit it with the light? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let me show you some of the things. Yikes. Let me show you some of the things. Like my friend here, he was painted with the holographic glitter. So it's beautiful, holographic illusions. And then some of the other pieces on here are some other glitter that we have, and you can see again how beautiful they are when they're dry. So let me, let me say one last thing, and that is that I hope you've enjoyed learning about just two of our new products that I'm, we're super excited about this year. You can find all of our products and more, especially all the new things at decoart.com, and look for great projects ideas involving all of these products at decoart.com slash projects. And as our giveaway, we are giving away a full set of the Enchanted and Enchanted Shimmers. So please, you're gonna show them that. Oh yes, I was gonna show you this. <laughs> Forgot about that. So here's the board, you can see how quickly it dries. And again, can you see straight up? Hold it closer, closer. Closer. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of see mm -hmm. how that works? And these again are the Enchanted and Enchanted Shimmers. They are absolutely gorgeous. So, woohoo! <laughs> you're gonna love them. Um, and lastly, please follow us on Facebook, Deco Art Inc., Instagram, Deco Art, Pinterest, Deco Art Inc. And thank you for joining us today and happy making. We have a couple of questions for you before you go. Sure. Um, just a lot of comments about how Deco Art is always innovative and they enjoy seeing all the new products. A lot of people okay. asking where the products are available and are they available in Canada, the US? What stores would carry them? I know somebody made comment that Stockade does carry some of the products here in Ontario, Canada. So uh, that I know is one place, but can they find that information on your website or how can they find the products? The best way. The best way. <laughs> you from. So the best way is to email us. Um, and we can let you know. Yeah, is to email us on our website. Because some of these things are so new that they are just now hitting stores. Okay. Did you get that? Did you hear that? Yeah. Some of the yeah. today are Hobby Lobby, Michaels, and Joann's. Um, and most, a lot of our products are there as well. As far as Canada, like Elizabeth said, email us or go on our website and we'll be happy to help you and help get product in your hands. Oh, perfect. And someone asked, what's a helping artist? The helping artist is a program whereby you sign up to our DecoArt website to 
to access all of these products in order to help you better serve the community through your art. And so we wanted to partner, Deco Art is a company who wants to partner with artists and give discounts and supply uh, art supplies and things and paint teachers. and for teachers so that teachers can teach and get better out there and be able to really have the supplies they need to make art because we really believe that art is such an important part of our community service. In fact, that's why our tagline is made for makers. We really, really stand behind teachers and artists. <clears throat> Wonderful. Wonderful. And I know if they go on the website, there is an information at the very yeah. bottom that says helping artists. And if they just click that, uh, they yes. can find out more information too and who to contact whether Absolutely. or not it's something yeah. that they could be mm -hmm. part of. So Yes. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth and Jennifer, for being with us today and showing us this new product. I think everybody's going to be out uh, purchasing it. So we really appreciate you being part of us and look forward to, to having with you again, us, or you with us again next time. So <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Well, and we have come to the end of our first Pin at Canada live virtual event. It has been incredible. Uh, I want to thank all the amazing artists, presenters, designers that uh, participated today to, to share their, their love of painting. Uh, we're so fortunate to have so many creative uh, people that are so passionate, energetic, inspirational, and just love to share their talents. And we're so, so pleased that we could bring that to you today, which would have been our first day of the Pin at Canada show in London. So this was, we've come to you now. So this has just been incredible. We are planning on another Pin at Live event in the fall, perhaps. So uh, just keep an eye out for that. And uh, it's really been fabulous. We have so many designers uh, that want to share their talent. And this is just a great way uh, to do it. So we hope to have our uh, show in Alberta in September. It is September 16th to the 20th. Uh, it's in Olds, Alberta, which is just north of uh, Calgary. And also we have rebooked our um, Pin at Canada show, the London show, uh, in June 2021. So if you go to pinatcanada.ca, or .com, uh, you will find all the information there as well, the new dates. And we are going to be working over the next couple months on what it's going to look like. So just stay tuned. Um, if you didn't catch the whole show, you certainly can go to our YouTube channel. We will have it up probably within a couple of days. Give us a little bit of opportunity here. Uh, but by next week, for sure, we'll have it up on our YouTube channel. Just pin it Canada. Put that in on YouTube and you will find us. Make sure you um, subscribe and ring that little bell. I didn't know what that little bell was all about, but I guess you ring that bell, you will get notified when we upload a new video. So that way uh, you'll just always get that notification. I wanna say a very special thank you to Judy and Ron Hampson. They're kind of back here. Maybe they can just come here. No, she's saying no, she's not coming here. <laughs> You saw Ron before, but anyway, this would not be even close to possible if it wasn't for Judy and Ron. They uh, helped me with every aspect of my uh, creative life, my techie life, and uh, my personal life as well. So we've been uh, great friends for probably almost 30 years now and uh, 29 years, and it's just been an incredible journey we've been on together. So uh, yeah, just want to thank them. And uh, just we continue to enjoy what we're doing together. Thank you for watching and uh, taking your time out of your day. Some of you might have been just for an hour or so. And I know some of you have been here all afternoon. So thank you. Until next time, it's Audrey. See you later.